load balancing is one of the most elegant ways of um, you know uh, finding the equivalent loads uh, which can basically uh, help you to uh, design the pre-stress concrete members and we also talked about uh, how to analyze a continuous uh, system as well and what are the procedures and so on so today i'll continue that uh, a little bit more uh, more from design point of view okay and uh, first uh, you know first 20 20 minutes i'll focus on some more design concepts which are which are basically uh, fundamental ones uh, to appreciate the steps uh, that uh, we are going to mm, discuss uh, towards the end of this um, uh, webinar right so this would be my overview of my presentation of course we just you know talked in depth about uh, what are the advantages of precious concrete and um, just a little bit uh, again a little bit more highlights on that uh, and what are the basic design concepts uh, that we use typically for designing a uh, either a pre-tension or a post-tension system and when we say post-tension bridge uh, you know of course it's uh, it, it's the main component is the the longitudinal girders but it's not only the thing you know you also have deck slab and i think uh, dr manjunath uh, in the last week he gave a very nice overview how to design a deck slab so again you know i'll touch upon a little bit on that because we'll be using it uh, in the design here and then uh, on designing the bursting zone again you know if you're not careful in a post tension system as we discussed in the last uh, last webinar um, uh, usually we go for post tension system when we want to apply large pre stressing force and um, and we want to go for a longer spans compared to pre tension systems so uh, in the anchorage zones if you're not careful enough you can develop a lot of uh, unwanted uh, cracking and failure so we need to be careful about uh, the design of bursting zone, that is the anchorage zone, uh, and then a little bit about cross girder design. So this is just going to be the overview of my uh, uh, webinar today. Right, again, just to, to give you a brief summary, of course, we talked about it. I think uh, with the advent of high strength concrete and with we know that concrete is strong in compression, weak in tension. So we want to create a stress state where we want to put compressive stresses even before any external loads are there, so that when external loads are coming, the compressive stress will delay the cracking. So that is the whole idea of pre-stressing. So you create a system of internal stress state. So, but with that, uh, we can you know nicely go for longer span constructions. Uh, in fact, uh, I think in the previous presentations by our engineer Vinay Gupta also, he showed various forms of systems. In fact, uh, cantilever, balanced cantilever construction and all, we can go as high as 150, 120 meters span as well. So, but simplest form of bridges are, of course, the T-beam bridges, uh, uh, you know, compared to that of uh, slab bridges. Uh, and usual spans are usually with the RC, we go for T-beam bridge up to 20 meters. Uh, but uh, with pre-stressing, even we can extend it. I will show you an example of a typical uh, T-girder post-tension bridge, uh, which is uh, designed for a span of uh, 35 meters. Anyway, so the whole idea of pre-stressing is basically we want to make the concrete to remain nicely happy in compression so that it's not going to see tension. The reason is the moment you have a lot of cracking, then it affects the durability. Again, we talked in detail about uh, uh, the service life of uh, these important structures, which is, you know, minimum. If you look at IRC code, the minimum design life for a bridge is 100 years, right? So you look at the span for 100 years, we want a structure that is has to serve the intended purpose without major cracking and with very good durability with less maintenance so that is why i think the pre-stressing uh, will help to eliminate the disadvantages of a reinforced concrete which is basically a passive reinforcing system so anyway though these different things are possible so we talked in nutshell about uh, last week as well about the advantages Again, uh, you know, with pre-stressing and with post-tensioning in particular, we can reduce the depth and we can go for large column-free space. That is what usually you want bridges because, you know, constructing a pier inside a river or some uh, valley, you know, it would be very, very difficult. So that is the reason why we go for pre-stress concrete. Again, we talked about it, I think, uh, in depth. Um, now, I think this is again a very important aspect is some of these concepts we are going to use it in the example that what we are going to discuss today. As I explained to you in the last uh, webinar, 
In a reinforced concrete system, what we do is we first design uh, the amount of reinforcement and detail the reinforcement by checking for ultimate strength. Okay, then you finalize your section dimensions and you know reinforcement and so on. Then you go ahead and check for serviceability, which includes for um, stress levels and which includes for track width, which includes for deflections and so on. In pieces concrete, because we are making sure that you know, of course, we have three types of systems: type one, type two, and type three. Uh, but in all of them, type three, you know, tensile stress, type two and type three tensile stress are allowed, but we make sure that the stresses are going to be within a certain limit. So pretty much in a pre uh, pieces concrete system, even in type three, you are allowing tensile stress, but the crack will be very, very minor. And uh, essentially the entire cross section is going to be predominantly in compression. So we can assume basically elastic stress analysis, at least for service load to check and uh, so that is the way we did it. first we designed for serviceability that is stress limits okay these are important and uh, then finally we check for strength okay you finalize your post tensioning or your pre stressing cable and area and so on then what we do if at all the strength if at all it is getting little less then what i can do is i can also put non pre stressed steel uh, uh, for additional strength requirement yeah, as long as the, but the predominant governing criteria is here serviceability that is the reason why we go for pieces again this also we talked about it i think briefly because uh, this is a very important concept in a reinforced concrete if you look at it um, usually what will happen is you know if i take a free body diagram of a simply supported beam for example which is subjected to a uniformly distributed load and then you know i what i have is you know to keep this body in equilibrium of course i have to have a moment now this moment is a bending moment is a couple so that couple has to be resisted. The resistance has to be developed by a force uh, in concrete and tension. Now, if you look at it carefully under service loads, you will find that with the increase in these loads, you know, when W2 is getting more than W1, what will happen is the lever arm will not change much. Okay. But the internal forces will keep increasing to give you the uh, required moment to satisfy the equilibrium condition. But in, in a pre-stress concrete system, what happens is, like I told you, in pieces, what we have, you can assume the steel like a rubber band. And what we really do is we stretch it and we lock some strain, right? And then we pour concrete in case of a pre-tension system or in case of a post-tension system, we are basically stressing the cable by reacting against the concrete member itself, right? So in that process, what we are really doing is we are locking a very high amount of tension force in the uh, strand. So, but if you look at under service loads, what will happen is because the, already this force is so high when loads are increasing, this internal forces are not going to change much. Then how do I get the moment resistance? The moment resistance I get by the movement of this C line, which we call it as a compression force. In fact, if there is no load, okay, and if let's say the beam is having no weight at all, then you know if you take a free body diagram in fact c will be at the location of t okay as i start increasing the applied load what will happen is this c fellow will start moving up okay so that is the way we generate internal moment resistance so now this concept is used uh, will be used for calculating various design parameters that is why i wanted to uh, stress on this aspect one more time All right so unlike reinforced concrete Okay, now in pieces concrete, when we analyze the section, we are going to have three stages. Okay, first is when you release the stress, okay, or when you're locking in stress, okay, that we call that as a transfer stage. Okay, basically, when we transfer the stress from steel to the concrete. Okay, in a pre tension system, what we do is uh, usually when the concrete has obtained the sufficient strength, then we cut the stack. Now, in a pretension system, as we discussed in the last webinar, uh, they are nicely bonded with the concrete. So they are going to basically pull the concrete or push the concrete inside. So you, you transfer the pre-stress through bond. Uh, and so that happens in a post-tension system. Of course, you know, when you anchor the strand, at this, that, is, that is the time. The ultimate strength for a pre-stress concrete member, or even a reinforced concrete member, it will happen, you know, only once. Once the system has seen its ultimate load, that means you know it is reaching failure right but most of the time our loads are under service loads right so under service loads what we make sure is we are going to check the stresses 
and we want to make sure that these stresses are lesser than the allowable limits okay that are specified by various codes the numbers it doesn't matter you know you have you have to satisfy the stress limits because we are also made an assumption that the concrete is going to be remaining predominantly in compression it's not going to see uh, cracking or very little cracking so uh, we, to make sure that we achieve what we are getting we need to make sure that under service loads these stress levels have to be satisfied of course you know the the fundamental assumptions uh, still remain valid that is the uh, plane sections remain plain uh, at until failure that is bernoulli's hypothesis that's what it is going to give you if you look at it from bending there is a linear strain variation across the cross section and for a bonded tendon and in india now we are also using a lot of external uh, post tension systems but more prevalent is a uh, external the bonded systems so there because you are going to grout it you are going to have a nice perfect bond between concrete and the, the surrounding concrete and the pre stressing steel so we, we are making this assumption so but one thing in a pre stress system is we are going to look at these three stages at all the three stages we have to uh, make sure that the stress levels are within the acceptable limit right again this i i i have explained you already uh, this is what what we do is the, you know there are three fundamental concepts of analysis which is called stress concept and the load balancing concept is what we discussed in the last webinar there is also one more concept which is called as a c line or a compression force method what we really do here is in this method we just take uh, this beam as a plain concrete beam because what we have seen in pieces concrete is these forces are under service loads mind you this is under service load but not at ultimate so these forces are going to not change much but i am going to have uh, the resistance only by the moving of this internal forces right from one another so we can also analyze the system by just applying this compression force at various levels uh, we apply as an eccentric compression and we can do the analysis okay so that is what usually it is done the c line method or a compression force method is what we use right so that is what we do and again like i said in pre stress concrete system you know you have to be careful uh, uh, in uh, applying it's not that you know you put lot of pre stress and you make concrete in compression it is not always correct what you may have is by in the process of putting lot of compression first itself bottom itself you may crush locally the concrete or if you are putting too much uh, compression force let's say at a eccentricity at a very high eccentricity what will happen is you are creating a camber that may also uh, uh, be little bit too much and then you may create tension at the top so in pre stressing it's not always that i put lot of pre stress you know it's good so we have to be careful because accidentally you may crack concrete where you really want it to crack right so so i talked to you about uh, these uh, concepts so if you look at it uh, you know we have what we are really doing is if you are looking at this section for example okay it's a longitudinal section where i am applying let's say an eccentric uh, pre stressing force and if you are going to analyze the system we know that what are the forces that are there let's say that the section is also i want to calculate this cracking moment okay because why it is important for cracking moment is because we are making sure that pre stress concrete pretty much it's going to remain crack free under its service stress okay so using your fundamental stress concept so this system cross section is subjected to an uh, axial compression force at an eccentricity e right so you're going to generate a axial compression which is p by e i'm taking compression as a negative now again this p is at a distance e from the cg so that is going to create a moment that is again is going to create a compression force at the bottom so i'm calculating stresses at the bottom that is why i'm taking yb from the center of gravity of the section so this is going to be i now if i equate this moment at which it needs to be cracking then you know you say again m by z is your stress that you are inducing but this moment will induce tension at the bottom so that is why i have plus so if you equate it you get a expression for your cracking moment so a very simple expression from strength of materials approach now we are going to calculate this moment at which the moment that is basically going to remove this compression remove this compression and it will reach a tensile stress magnitude of this modulus of rupture and we know that modulus of rupture uh, you know it is a function of your compressive strength in as as is 4 to physics defines it as 0.7 square root of fc so we can calculate that. now the reason why again you know I, I, I am talking about this fundamental aspects is we want to make we, we are going to analyze or design this beam 
for service stage. So service stage, uh, like again, I have told you, so this is going to be mostly crack free. So you can use the C line method. So that is what I said. These are all the concepts that will be used to, to make sure that under service stage, you, def you design the cross section in such a way that the stress levels will be within the uh, allowable limits. Again, these are all just like upper current point and lower current point. And these are all some sectional uh, uh, properties, just like your moment of inertia uh, or a CG of a cross section. So these are also some uh, concepts that are defined for designing the pre-stress compensation. So how do we calculate this turn point? So the reason why is, like I said, the C, the compression force will start moving away from T, right? So just by looking at where the C is located within the cross section, then I can find out whether, uh, you know, the, uh, the stress levels are satisfied or not. So this upper current point is also what we are seeing is the C is keeps moving under service stage usually the C will start moving away. Initially, C is going to be at the level of steel, and then it is going to start moving. Away. Now, the C can move to a point of KT in such a way that it is going to produce a zero tensile stress at the bottom. So, like I said, in the C line method, in compression method, I can just take the free body diagram, apply the C at an eccentric distance from CGC, and then calculate what is the maximum distance the C fellow can move so that it will give me a zero stress at the bottom. So again, simple expression, now I only see that is acting at an eccentric distance of KT. So the stress state is, if I'm calculating stress at the bottom at a distance of YB from the CGC, and now I'm going to have compressive stress because of the axial component, and then this C is also creating a moment because it is acting at an eccentric state. So if I equate that, I will get the expression for your stress, but I want to make sure that the stress at this point is zero. So I can find an expression for how much the C can move away from CGC. So that is, if you do simplification, you will find that that is nothing but your R square by YB. So along the same same way now, you know, because what, what happens when C is at the lower point, now, you know, you are, you are, you are not applied too much of your external moment. It is just, you know, so that is a condition that will happen when you transfer the priestess. Again, in, when you're transferring the priestess, you will have a lot of compression at the bottom, right? And then maybe you may have less tension or uh, zero tension at the top. So I'm creating again a distance at which I have to keep the C so that my stress level or stress limits at the top is going to be zero. So again, I can equate from your basic strength of materials equation. I can find an expression for your KT lines, right? So maybe I'll use a pointer just to find Right, so this is how we get. Again, these are purely, if you look at it, R square by Vt. R square is nothing but radius of variation, square of radius of variation, so which is nothing but R is equal to square root of I by A. It's a purely a sectional property. And now I can also find, if I'm, if I'm allowing some stress levels here, you know, instead of zero stress, I can also allow some tension stress. That's what type two and type three members, they do. Okay, in fact, the IRC 112 also, they allow partially precess sections. For ultimate scene. so you can allow to have some tensile stresses as well, but uh, it's it's always not uh, unless it is really required. You know we should not go into type three members because then you start losing the advantages of uh, pre-stress conflict member to an extent. So that's one. So again, like I said, so this the pressure line concept is you know now we looked at it what is happening in the cross section. Now at the member level also. At every cross section, my moment to demand is going to be different. So what will happen is depending upon the amount of your moment, bending moment demand, now the compression force will not be at this location of your uh, CB or uh, at the level of your steel, it will start moving away. Okay. So how much it has really moved away from CGC will give me, give me an idea if, if I know that C is going to be within this KB and KT, and I know for a fact and all the cross sections, why well, I'm satisfying the stress, le stress limits for tension, both at the uh, bottom, uh, while I'm doing the service stress state, and then at the top, while I'm doing the transfer, because at, when we're transferring the uh, pre-stressing force, I'm going to have tension at the top. There is a possibility of having tension at the top. That's what we saw in the image that you are having camber, 
right? So that camber is possible because you are applying a moment which is counterclockwise through by precess. So just by calculating this pressure line, then making sure that the C is within this KT and KB, then I can make sure that uh, my stress levels are satisfied. So I can also relax this value of KT and KB by a little bit, depending upon how much tensile stress that I can allow both at top and bottom at different levels of my analysis. So uh, we can calculate. So now for, uh, so again, you know, for a particular point, now we saw that uh, the C is going to move away, right? So the C is going to be moving away uh, uh, at the different points. So if I know the moment that is acting at the location, now we know that in a precess concrete member, the C and T doesn't change much. So if I know the moment, if I divide by the C, which is equal to the tension force that I have locked in, then I can find out the lever. So once I know the lever arm, then I can also find out the, uh, the level of the C force where it is going to act. Okay, So that is basically this location is called as EC. That is how much it has moved away from CGC is your C. Let's say C. And C is equal to anyway T. Okay? So because we say that at the service stage, the C and T value doesn't change much. So once I calculate my lever arm, then how much it has moved away from CGC, I can quickly calculate by subtracting with the eccentricity of the tendon because the profile of the tendon is already I have to assume. So I can calculate at all the cross section this pressure line. Okay. So this is the way that uh, we make sure that uh, by just by plotting this compression line along the length of the member and uh, depending upon whether type 1 or type 2 or type 3. For a type 1 member, just if I look at this blue line, okay, if this blue line is within this KT and KB in all the cross section, that means that I'm not going to violate any tensile stress limits. So that means the C is going to be, this zone is what we call it as a kern zone. Okay, so this is what we call this a kern zone. So by creating this pressure line, then quickly I can tell whether I am satisfying the stress limits or not. Okay, so this is the fundamental concept. So using the C-line method of analysis, quickly I can calculate basically where my stress levels are there. Okay, now uh, in fact, uh, just quickly about what are the different types of uh, choice of section that we use. Okay, and uh, we, we have seen that in uh, in buildings usually, you know, we don't put even when we use precast systems, unless it is the parking garages or so, you don't see the double T girders or uh, this mostly it will be rectangular members that will be there. Okay. But when it comes to bridges, because we want to span a long member uh, between the columns and I want to make sure that I reduce the dead weight as much as possible. So uh, how can I reduce the dead weight is basically we have to look at the efficiency of the cross section. And the moment you go longer and longer, then what will happen is the bending will start dominating the behavior. For bending uh, dominant design, usually what we make, make sure that, you know, from your first principles, you know that if you look at your stress profiles close to the neutral axis, basically, you are having limited stresses or zero stress, right? So you really don't need to put a lot of material close to the neutral axis. So if I'm putting material which is farther away from the neutral axis, then that would be more efficiently utilized. So that is the whole idea why usually the box sections or I sections are fluxurally very efficient. In fact, that is why in precast systems also in floors, hollow core slabs are very commonly used because hollow core slabs are actually, if you look at it, it can be idealized as an I section. I'm taking away the material close to the neutral axis where it is not really required. But, but if you're taking away material close to the neutral axis, then there is also a problem. If the member is subjected to significantly uh, higher shear stresses, then the cross section may not be sufficient. But in bridges, we know that if you're, especially when you go for a, a simply supported girder bridge, we know that my bending moment is going to be larger in the mid span and the shear is going to be larger at the support. So what we do is, even though I'm going to use I sections in my, for flexural members, when I get closer to the support, what we do is we make the section as a rectangular one to make it more stronger in shear. At the same time, I can also put a lot of stresses for anchorage zones and so on, right? So when we choose a section, we need to make sure that it, of course, it should have a larger depth because as you all know, the EI 
is your flexural rigidity. I want to have as much as high of this value EI, right? So I will be larger when your uh, moment of inertia is larger. So that can happen only uh, when your depth okay, is directly proportional to the cube root of the depth. So we want to make sure that larger depth. And also we want to have a larger depth below CGC so that I can put these cables at a larger eccentricity so that the amount of precessing force required to satisfy the stress limits are going to be coming down. And also we need to make sure that there is adequate amount of concrete at the top and bottom so that the allowable stress limits also will be satisfied. And like I said, the end section will be usually made solid to increase the shear capacity and prevent the anchorage zone failure. Now, I mean, these are all different types of sections uh, uh, that are that are usually used. Like I said, I mean, for bridges, you know, if you, because we are going to, if you're looking at uh, uh, for a mid span uh, moment, you know, usually, you know, these kind of high sections are put uh, uh, very preferred, right? Because I can accommodate a lot of strands in the flanks, right? And also, I'm going to have larger eccentricity, okay? So that is the reason usually the high sections are more preferred, but different varieties are uh, possible depending on and also the box girders are very very uh, you know uh, commonly used in bridge construction so it is not only flexurally very efficient it is also for torsion and shear also it is very very efficient that's why the box girders are very commonly used when you go for a again a longer span and it can be combined with post tensioning systems to make it even more efficient for various types of load. And these are usual span to depth ratios that are used and uh, double T beams and bridge girders, you know, usually we try to keep a uh, span to depth ratio in the order of 25 to 30. Right. <clears throat> now, how do I uh, make sure that I have a very efficient cross section? So if you look at it, we measure by how large is this current zone. So that is KT, KT plus KB. That zone, if it is larger, then that is basically giving me uh, for the C to remain within the larger zone under service. So the section efficiency is usually measured by this parameter called eta, which is nothing but the distance of KT plus KB divided by H. So that, uh, of course, you know, if you simplify this equation, then you find expressions in the form of R squared by CT and CB, where CT and CB are your CT or CB or YT or YB, depending upon your sign conventions. For rectangular section, if you calculate this parameter, it works out to be 0.33 only. So it's not a very efficient cross-section for flexion. For I sections, depending upon how you put your flanges, definitely eta value can be very high, right? So it will be definitely much, much larger than this point. That is why in flexure, you are basically you are taking away material from close to the neutral axis and we are trying to put it where we are going to have larger stresses. So that is the idea why even in post tension system, we will exactly will do the same thing. Right. So how do I just quickly look at the uh, dimensions? Because, you know, we, you know, design is an iterative process, okay? In fact, even in design, what we really do is we do analyze. We do the analysis by assuming some certain, certain parameters, okay? So design is an iterative process. So first of all, to get my demand itself, I need to assume some sexual dimensions, right? So I have to do anyway preliminary design to start with. Then I go ahead and fine tune the parameters to basically optimize the section and the reinforcement requirement. So one way to usually look at the preliminary design is, okay, we make sure that the average stress, that is P effective is effective stress after losses and losses uh, also we discussed in the last uh, uh, webinar, we have losses from shrinkage, creep and relaxation and so on. And so most of the time, you know, people assume eta parameter as 0.15 to 0 0.2, okay. So 15 to 20 percentage as a lump sum loss we do. And we also have accurate uh, uh, process of calculating this uh, uh, losses, okay. So if you if you subtract uh, the precessing force, you know, 85 percentage of the initial precessing force, your effective precessing force, if you calculate your average stress, we, we have to make sure that at service stage, you know, the average stress that you're putting across the cross section should not go more than 50 percentage of your allowable uh, That is a one rough uh, way of uh, choosing your preliminary design. Then, you know, of course, you know, uh, the design of the, 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 the starting of the project itself, you know, uh, characteristic strength of steel, that is always fixed. Of course, compressive strength of concrete, uh, we will choose, depending, you know, for slabs, usually uh, 25 or 30 megapascal views. For post tension girders, usually we go for 50 or 60 megapascal concrete, right? To, so that the, the strength in tension is also going to go up, right? 
and then we look at the uh, depth of the beam. So usually the depth of the beam is, you know, roughly can be equated to 0 0.03 square root of m to 0 0.04 m. Or uh, uh, for post tension girder, what we do is if you are putting pre stressing, usually depth what we take is, you know, 60 mm for every meter. Okay. Just a, a rough example. If you are looking at a RC uh, T beam girder, usually we go for 100 mm. Uh, per meter. So if you're, let's say, if you're, if you're going for a 30 meter span for a post tension girder system, then we usually go for a 1.8 or so. Of course, we can we can we can reduce it and put more precessing and so on. But this is just a thumb rule to start with your preliminary design. Okay, right. And uh, for uh, sections, of course, you know, for buildings, like I said, we go for a rectangular section. Sometimes, depending upon the where the location is, if you have a a composite action, then you take the effective width of the slab also as a part of the beam. Uh, but for bridges, you know, like you said, we, we usually go for I sections or a box girder section. In fact, box girder section also actually in flexure, it, it can be idealized as a I section. Okay. Right. So it's always better to have a wider flanges and thinner webs. Okay. So that uh, your uh, eccentricity of the precessing force will go up. And you can also reduce the dead weight. Okay. Again, in concrete uh, compared to steel, is because that you, you start putting a lot of material that sulfate of the members go up. So we need to make sure that we put the material where we actually really want it. So that we have to be careful. So uh, sulfate in a in a case of a bridge systems, it can be 30, 40 percentage of the live load requirement as well. In fact, in fact, sulfate can be much larger also. In fact, that also I'll show you in one of in, the, in our example, you'll find that. Uh, Sulfate of the system is going to be much, in fact, twice than that of your live load member. So then, like I said, the lever arm. Uh, initially, like I said, so this is your T force and this is your compression force. Inside, it is going to keep moving up. So how much it has moved up, that is what is your lever arm. So uh, to estimate, you know, your uh, this forces, now that you have estimated your lever arm, uh, your, your uh, estimated your depth as a function of your span, now I can also approximate my lever arm as 65 percentage of your overall depth. Okay. Then once you do that and you calculate it, you do your analysis and you get your moment, then you can, like I said, the moment resistance is nothing but C times Z. Right. So you can divide by the C is always the precessing force that we are trying to calculate. Right. So now that you found H and Z, so you divide by the moment, then you will get approximately what is the effective precessing force and that particular cross section that you need. I can also use, if your loads are uniformly distributed, if you can somehow come up with a uniformly distributed load, then using load balancing that what we discussed in the last webinar, using that also quickly you can calculate what is the uh, the total precessing force that is required, right? So that also you can you can calculate. Right, so then what we do once you get your precessing force, then you assume uh, your effective precess after losses to be like 70% uh, of your characteristic strength of steel, then you can calculate your area of precessing. So once you optimize all these things, then we go ahead and check for stresses. Okay, now that I come up with the initial dimension and initial precess, then I start playing with the cross section and the amount of precessing force to make sure that the stress levels are not violated. Uh, depending upon what type of member that we are designing, right? So again, you know, like I said, this is how we put the amount of precess in steel and the uh, the cross section dimensions. Once I do that, I also need to make sure that the amount of precess in steel is adequate for ultimate strength. So that is where MUR. That we can calculate using IRC one one two given uh, using the stress 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 blocks and uh, constitutive equation that are given in your IRC one one two and make sure that it is. Okay, so this is again, you know, we, we talked about, I think Professor Busari also uh, talked to you a little bit about this limiting zone. Uh, we want to make sure that the cable profile is going to be within the zone. If it is within the zone, then again, uh, you will you will make sure that the C will always be lying within the current zone. Okay, so these are upper and lower limits where my CG, the center of gravity of the strand or tension steel has to be located within the cross section along the length of the strand, then my C will always be remaining within the turn zone. Now, how do I uh, do that? Again, for a type one member, we know that, uh, you know, like again, I'm using the C line method of concept. So C, if, uh, you know, at the, when I'm doing the transfer, I have to force from priestess and then only the sulfide will be there. Okay, these are the two things that are going to act. 
So that is why because the sulfide is already acting, the C would have slightly moved, up, moved away from your T. Uh, but a transfer again, because I'm locking this, my stress condition for type 1 is going to be zero stress at there. So I can make sure I can plug in this equation and I can quickly calculate how much is my E max. Okay, now this E max, I can, you know, if, if you know the C and uh, we know that how much the, the distance it would have moved is basically MSW by P naught is basically nothing but your this E max minus how much this has moved. Okay. So that, that is basically your lever arm, right? So from that, if you know your sulfate moment and if you know your P naught and this KB is anyway is a sectional parameter. So I can calculate how much is the maximum eccentricity that is possible for my, um, the tension strand. Similarly, I can do the same thing for service. Now, again, at service, the loads have increased. Now, what are the loads that are there? P is there. Not only sulfide, now also I have live load moment. Okay. Now, the C has moved away. Okay. Farther away from CGC, then I am finding what is the minimum eccentricity at the particular process. And again, here, I have to make sure that I my stress is basically uh, at is going to be uh, less than uh, zero stress at the bottom. At service, of course, tension is going to be at the bottom. So at this location, I want to make sure that this location. Okay. So this is the way we can find out. Again, same process. Okay. Now, in type 2 members, what we are doing, it's not only zero stress. I can also allow some tension. Okay. But to develop at the top, while well, you are doing transferring the pre-stress, in, uh, in service, of course, this stress can be, at the bottom can be, again, uh, some tensile stress can be allowed. So now for a type 2 and type 3 member, so that means I'm having a more play uh, in the cross section for placing my strand so that the C will be within the zone. Okay. So now I have, I can slightly, you know, uh, relax the condition because I'm allowing some tensile stresses to develop. So again, that we can. Right. So this is one thing. And now to put everything together, like you said, Basically, this Magnell's graphical method is quite uh, widely used because, like I said, the cross-section dimensions, we come up with our initial thumb rules, but the amount of precessing steel and uh, the, the location of E, we, can, we have to make sure that under service levels, four conditions are satisfied, right? So, at transfer, again, uh, I'm going to have precessing force and I'm going to have only self -fight. These are the loads that are going to be acting. Now, I'll add service, I'm going to have effective pre-stressing force because the pre-stressing force would have lost. Now, I'll have moment due to self -fight and then moment due to live load. Okay, all of them will act. Okay, so at both the conditions are transfer. Now, again, like what we discussed, now C or the compression force is going to be at the level of, uh, now it's going to be at the bottom, right? So, I'm going to develop some tension at the top. So, at the stress at the top has to be less than the allowable tensile stress for concrete, okay, at the top. Similarly, at the bottom also, if I put a lot of pre-stress, I can violate my compression stress. This thing will exactly reverse under service because now the live load moment is going to come that is going to create a lot of moment. So, you may uh, create tension at the bottom and uh, uh, compression at the uh, top. So, again, these inequalities have to be satisfied. Now, here what I'm saying is uh, these equations can be set up in terms of inequality because compression here, I'm taking it as negative. That is why stress at the bottom is greater than FCC allowable because FCC allowable, I'm taking it a, in a negative. So, by equating uh, just for one example, a transfer, if you put these equations, then I can calculate the stress at the top at this value, okay? Now, the stress at the top has to be less than FCT allowable. So, I can write an expression for if this FT is limited to FCT allowable, okay? Then I can find an expression for 1 by P naught and E as a function of other parameters, okay? So, this is the way we try to uh, draw a zone, okay, for different conditions. Now, there are four equations that we talked about, I think, right? So, this, 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 this is one, this is two, this is three, and this is four. So, there are four stress conditions that I need to, I can express in terms of inequalities, and I can find a uh, thing. So, if my stress levels are, if I choose a value of P naught and E in such a way that if I'm within this zone, okay? So, this is an acceptable zone. So, I can express these equations in a, a simple equations in an Excel, and then I can start 
playing with my sectional parameters and P naught and E to make sure that I'm going to be within the zone so that I'm going to satisfy the stress limits at transfer as well as at service. Okay. So in this way, we can quickly check our whether the chosen dimensions are okay and the chosen precessing force and eccentricity of the cable are. So when we look at the design, there are these are the things that we worry about, right? How much is the maximum dimensions that I need to choose for to satisfy or to safely transfer the, uh, the externally applied load? And then how much is the amount of precessing that I need to lock in? And what should be the eccentricity? Of course, this is valid for one cross section. Okay, and what we do, we need to make sure that. Uh, but this, when we do, when we go for pieces, this P naught is for, especially for a post engine system. P naught is always constant. Okay, though there is going to be friction losses, we we are going to assume that P naught is going to be constant. So that is once you lock it, that's that's locked. Then then only thing that I have in my hand is varying the eccentricity of the cable. That is basically the cable profile. Okay, so by controlling this P naught E and the sectional parameters. I can make sure that I am satisfying my stress levels for all the four conditions, right? So that is what we usually do. Okay. So with this background, now I'll quickly uh, go through uh, one uh, example uh, because I thought, you know, if I just directly jump to an example, uh, then, uh, you know, this concept, some of these things you may not appreciate. So that is why I, I thought, you know, a little bit of overview is important. Now, uh, we have we talked about various advantages. Let's look at one example where I have to design a bridge for an effective span of 35 meter and width of the road is 8.4 meter. And of course, these are all standard dimensions. Curbs are usually taken as 600 mm and footpath as 1.5 meter on each side. And the thickness of the wearing coat, usually it is very from 80 mm, 90 mm or 100 mm, depending upon what type of coating that you are, you are putting, right? And uh, uh, live load, you know, it is in this example, it has been taken as class AA track vehicle for municipal limits if the load is, if the, if the, if the highway is coming in the municipal limit. And in fact, if you look, uh, look at the track uh, loading uh, for IRC class A and 70R, they are nearly same. It, it accounts to uh, 70 tons of load. Uh, okay, so this is the example with which we are going to see how to design the system. These are the input parameters. Okay. And also at the design stage itself, I need to choose what are the different types of material that I'm going to use because for the entire project, these things will be finalized initially at that. So usually for Dex Lab, we, you know, they are heavily under reinforced. Okay. And so we don't need to really go for a very large strength concrete. So Dex Lab, usually we choose a lower grade concrete. So we go for uh, M30 concrete or M20, 25 is also okay. Uh, but for post tension concrete girders, uh, we, we can use M50 because uh, we are going to lock in a lot of stresses. So we need to satisfy our stress limits. So I'm going to choose M50 for my precious concrete or to a post tension concrete beam. And with the limit that uh, I cannot exceed 40 megapascals. In fact, for a pre-tension member, most of the time they are made in factory and they want to increase the production cycle. So uh, the strength of concrete will be very low when I'm transferring the stress. Right. So that is one advantage with post tension concrete because post tension concrete, by the time we are going to do the stressing, the concrete would have most of the time would have attained its full strength. Okay. So we can go for a larger stress, allowable stress. And like I said, loss ratio, when you go for a post tension system, uh, we have talked about friction losses are going to be very, very high uh, that we need to account for it. And usually what people do is they also go for jacking from both the ends and so on. Uh, to make sure that there is average uh, stress is maintained. Uh, but uh, in uh, post tension system, like I said, depending upon the curvature of your cable profile, uh, total cumulative curvature change will add to your loss. If you have a lot of continuous systems, you have a lot of single cable if you're using uh, with a lot of up, up and down cable profile, then your losses are going to be high. But in case, in this case, we are doing a simply supported girder, so there is, that's not a big issue. Um, and uh, I also, I have to, you know, uh, choose some dimensions. We have, we have kept this distance as 35 meter. Okay. Now, 35 meter is the span and the girders are going to be 35 meter. In between, what we do is we also use this cross girders. Okay. And uh, because again, the thickness of the deck slab will add uh, very much to your, um, uh, your uh, dead load. 
So we want to reduce this thickness of the slab as much as possible because if you go for a one-way system, it's not economical. Uh, first of all, strength also. In a two-way system, you will get a lot of uh, redistribution of loads. So you get very good performance. So uh, to make sure, you know, I can reduce the thickness of the slab, you know, we we, we need to put this cross girder spacings for lateral stability of the girder as well. So we have, I've assumed a cross girder spacing of 5 meter and to make sure that the demand in the slab is also going to come. Okay, and I'm going to use safety 500 grade steel and uh, uh, 0.6 inch strand. Okay, either use half inch strand or 0.6 inch strand, and that con conforming to IS 6006. And uh, we're going to design the girder as class one or type one. Okay, either way we can call it type one members. That means no tensile stress are allowed. And permissible stress in concrete at transfer is 20 megapascal, and principal stress in concrete at service load is 18 megapascal. And uh, design should uh, conform to IRC 6 2014, IRC 112, and so on. And for ultimate strength calculations, I'm going to use IS 1343 because it gives you an approximate uh, table to quickly do the calculations. So I'm going to use this. Uh, so that is why I'm, I'm conforming my design to uh, these standards. And you'll find that the service loads uh, are transfer, you know, because in post engine system, we are going to do the stress, we are going to observe the stress. So slightly you can go for a slightly higher limit uh, in uh, this stress. Of course, this uh, uh, these are the uh, wheel type loading. I think uh, Dr. Manjanath also gave you a good overview. And uh, this is a tracked vehicle. Okay. Here in this example, we are going to use IRC class AA. Okay. If you're using a 70R, of course, this is also similar. Loads are, like I said, both of them are going to have 70 tons. Only this distribution area will be slightly different. But otherwise, the load for a tractive wheel system for AA or 70R is 70 tons only. Right. So again, class AA, again, you know, this is the uh, wheel uh, type pattern. So we can see here and each uh, uh, this wheel pattern will have uh, 350 tons, 350 tons and it is distributed over a width of uh, 3850 mm and that bottom width length of this dispersion is about 3.6 meter and these uh, separation of these tracked wheels are about 1.2 meters and we are going to use this okay so we're going to stick to this uh, loading pattern okay so if you look at it that's what you know uh, irc class loadings depending upon the carriageway uh, width you know you, you have to assume the loading uh, and this is just a quick summary. Again, it is courtesy from Dr. Manjana. So he has uh, given uh, here, right? So IRC 70 or 70 tons. Again, Class A is also 70 tons. They are very close. Okay. And usually we use 70 R for permanent bridges and culverts and Class A for municipal limit. In the problem that was given, this bridge is at a municipal limit. So anyway, the loads are same. So that is why I've taken Class A for your example. And uh, our uh, carriageway width is also lying in between. So uh, this is a two lane uh, bridge. So we can ideally either you design for a one lane class of 70 or two uh, lanes of class A. Class A has only wheel type loading and that loading is also, we have seen that it is uh, 55 only. So uh, if you design for this 70 tons, so anyway, the design would be adequate. So that's what the code is also allowing either one lane of class 70 or, or two lanes of class A. Okay, so we are going to use some of these expressions in our uh, reinforcement calculations. So this is again basic from a uh, uh, simple reinforced concrete design. And if you take a singly reinforced section, and if you at an ultimate, if you assume concrete strain to be 0 0.0035 and steel is going to reach yield strain of this as per the code, then I can find an expression using linear strain diagram for XU limit. So this is the maximum limit, the neutral axis that is allowed as per the code to make sure that the steel intention is going to yield right so if you find expression for your xu limit then you put it into your uh, internal resistance for concrete because maximum concrete force that is uh, possible is 0.36 fck b times your xu and xu is going to be xu limit and xu limit is always you know it's it's a function of your grade of your steel okay because we are fixing the yield strain so yield strain is not function of your concrete strength it is function of only the uh, the the grade of steel. So you plug in this equation for a particular grade, the XU limit by D is fixed. Okay, so this is 0.46. So you plug in this equation and then you find your expression for your MU limit. Uh, in this case, okay, 
you equate because we are using FE500 steel, so that we are taking 0.134 FCK bd square. Again, uh, this is from your uh, fundamentals of your reinforced concrete limit state design. Uh, we are taking this, right? And we are going to uh, use uh, for uh, uh, for slabs M30 for girders. We are going to use 50 megapascal. And uh, these are allowable uh, stresses for uh, co compression in transfer. We are limiting it to 20. And in service, I want to make sure that it is going to be at 80. Okay. These are my design requirements. Okay. Of course, these limits will change. You know, if you're looking at uh, carefully, you know, if you're doing a building design or a bridge design, you know, these stress limits will change. You have to follow the code that what you're adopting. Right. Now, the cross section of depth. So we have 8.4 uh, meter. Right. So and 1.5 meter footpath, right, curve. So if you look at the cross section, so this is what uh, uh, I have uh, ended up with. So I'm going to put at least, you know, like I said, we want to make sure that uh, um, the depth of the slab, uh, depth of this beam is uh, roughly, you know, I said 35 meter by uh, every meter, you know, you get 60, 60 mm. So if you multiply by 60 mm, then approximately you can fix your depth of your uh, overall girder for 30 meter. The 60 mm is a thumb rule for a post tension girder. If you're using RC uh, slab element, usually we take it as 100 mm per meter. So uh, you can you can you can uh, split up these uh, beams in this way. Uh, you can also reduce this beam to three also. Uh, that is also possible. But again, your slab requirements will go. So we have done the trials. We found that I think these four girders will be uh, ideal. So that is why I'm choosing this dimensions of 2.8 meter and uh, with the cross curve. Right, so I'm taking a dead slab thickness of 250 mm. Now you can ask me, how did you come up with this 250 mm? I'll, I'll show you. Uh, but usually for the bridges, minimum deck slab thickness is taken as 200 mm. And usually it's measured into, you know, you go in increments of 25 mm. Uh, Again, you know, the whole thing is you don't want to put too much also uh, uh, because the dead load is going to uh, increase quite significantly, right? So that is why, you know, in fact, if you reduce the cross spacing of your uh, cross gutter spacing as well, so you can slightly reduce your thickness of the slab. Uh, I'll show you this 250 mm itself is just uh, adequate for this span. So uh, we kept, again, the curves are 600 mm by wide by 300 mm, provided deeper provided. So this is the curve. And the main girders are precast, and the slab connecting uh, girders uh, are uh, cast in situ. That means only this portion is basically uh, precast, and they uh, take it to the site and erect it, and then this deck slab is poured on site, right? And you always you'll have these kind of uh, shear dowels to make sure that there is a composite action between the um, the deck slab and the precast girder. And spacing of the girder again, you know, we have done some trials, and I'm going to show you this five meters seeming to be working okay. And uh, spacing of the uh, main girders, so that is this, between this to this is kept as 2.8 meters, and the cross girders are kept at 5 meters. Right, so again, you know, uh, Dr. Manjunath has already explained this, but anyway, for the sake of uh, completeness, I'll just quickly go through this. Uh, because I've taken 250 mm slab and uh, unit weight of concrete, I'm taking it as 24. So if you multiply by that, then you get uh, per meter, uh, you know, length, you get a uh, 6 kilonewton per meter square of slab. Uh, weight and the wearing coat I'm taking 100 mm, so 0 0.1 and in unit weight of 22. So you multiply, you get a 2.2 kilonewton per meter square load. So you add them up, the total dead load for the slabs working out to be 8.2 kilonewton per meter square. That means for one meter by one meter area. And uh, the load, what we have taken is IRC class A track vehicle. And uh, like uh, explained uh, previously also by Dr. Manjana. So we are going to place this wheel. At the center of the panel, now you can see that this is a continuous, uh, it's a two-way slab, right? So because the slab is, the boundaries are basically your cross girders on this side, and then you have these main girders on this side, right? So if you look at it, so this is the panel dimension, which is 5 meters by 2.8 meter, over which I'm having a, a wheel that is kept at the center of the panel. Again, we can look at the dispersion uh, from the size of the wheel. And if you keep your size of the wheel as B and W, right? So you go through the uh, 45 degree assumption when you make. So this total dimension, because this is 100 mm we have kept, and this we have taken as 250 mm. So for the assumed wheel dimensions of uh, B and W, uh, I can calculate how much is my U on V. So this is U basically. So that means basically along the 
uh, the span direction. So my dispersion is going to be V and along this direction, I'm going to have U as my dispersion so that we can uh, calculate. Right, so once we uh, do uh, this uh, calculations for this, uh, the, the, the beam dimensions for, we work out to be 1.05 and uh, 3.8 meters. So if you look at it, so of course the dimensions B and uh, uh, the, 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 the dimensions of the wheel is 0.85 meter and 3.6 meter. So you, uh, you go another 100 mm, so to get your U and V as uh, basically 1.05 and 3.8 uh, meters. And then you take the ratios of U and uh, B and similarly V by L. And then we use the Pigot's curves, and uh, again, uh, that was explained by Manjana. So it is based on orthotropic plate theory uh, with certain assumptions that are there. And we are, we are, we are assuming the slab to be bending in two directions. And uh, we are going to have, because it's a, these are also slabs are continuous over this cross girders as well as the longitudinal girders. You're going to develop some negative moment and positive moment. So these moments, the total moment values are given as per the values of U by B and V by L. Then you get this moment coefficients depending upon what value that you have. So if you see here, we got 0 0.375 and 0.76. So I go to 0.375 and then I choose for the particular K value that is aspect ratio of the panel, which is 2.8 by 5. So I take this 2.8 by 5. So that is working out to be again 0.56. So then I go, I go to the refer to the P guards curves and then I get the moment coefficients M1 and M2. So that uh, uh, you get a value of about a 0.099 and 0 0.022. So that is what we get here. So you see here. Right, so you choose both U by V and V by L, and if you calculate this value, so that is for that value, you get this value and this value, right? So those values are basically uh, your uh, 0 0.099 and 0 0.022. Now the moment is going to be the total wheel load W times M1 plus 0.15 M2. So 0.15 is nothing but your Poisson's ratio of concrete. Poisson's ratio of concrete is assumed to be 0.15 because it's going to have bending. So because of the bending in one direction, so now you'll have the curvature on the other direction as well. So because of the curvature, you're going to develop bending in the other direction as well. So you substitute these magnitudes and you get your value as 35.81 kilonewton meter. And similarly, because like I said, this uh, slab is continuous. So for the mid span moment, we take it as 80 percentage of your uh, the total moment that is calculated that again, we need to amplify it for uh, impact as well as the uh, continuity factor and impact factor is uh, uh, taken as uh, point, uh, uh, 1.25 and point 0.8 is your continuous factor because this is your total moment. Okay. Whatever that MB that we got, okay, if you look at your fixed fixed beam, what you get is basically this kind of a distribution, right? Now, what we have said is I have calculated only this total moment that is called M0. So, what the 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 uh, the, the, the Pigot's curve, what assume is because of this ratios, what it is saying is, okay, this magnitude, the positive moment is only 80 percentage of that, okay? So, that is why we take this 80 percentage of this and then and we multiply for impact factors because the vehicle is going to have impact factors. So I'm going to amplify this moment by 25 percentage. So finally, it, it works out to be the same value because this value is 0 0.8 and 1.25. And that when you multiply it, it works out to be 1. So you get your uh, short span moment. And of course, the long span moment is going to be lesser, uh, right? Obviously, you will have when your panel is deflecting, the shorter direction will take larger moment and the longer direction will take a, a smaller moment. So again, using these coefficients, you get these values as 12.9 and 35.81. And you find that these are your bending moments, okay, for the live load, okay. For the live load, uh, because of the wheel positions, we got your bending moment coefficients. Now again, we do the same process for shear. I mean, two-way slabs, see, slabs are necessarily not very dominant in shear, but that is for buildings. But here in this panel, what you are doing is almost, you know, you're putting a 350 kilonewton in a small panel of uh, 2.6 by uh, 5 meters, right? So that is going to basically squeeze the slab and it can fail in shear. So it's not necessary that in buildings it is true, you know, one-way shear is not an issue. 
but in two in in bridge system because you are subjecting it to a huge wheel load you can have deficiency in shear in fact that is the reason we have to provide a like slightly higher thickness of the slab otherwise for flexure only for these moments in fact even we could have gone with 150 mm slab but you will find that in the equations this uh, the shear is what it was controlling the depth okay that is the reason we have to go for a slightly higher depth so to calculate your shear demand again we are positioning the wheel in such a way that this dispersion is going to be exactly going to the full depth okay so that is again uh, we we keep it like this so if you go with this dispersion 0.85 is a size the wheel size if you take this 45 degree assumption so you position in such a way that the center of this loading it works out to be 0.775 uh, meters right and uh, uh, so for the such a uh, position, so basically this is uh, along the uh, stand. Now in the perpendicular direction, we need to make sure how what is the effective width of the slab that is basically uh, distributing this uh, wheel load. So that we keep it as, uh, again, like I said, this CG of this load is going to be acting at 0.75 meter for this dispersion. Now in the perpendicular direction, you need to calculate your effective width of the slab. So that is given by this uh, expression Kx times 1 minus x by L uh, plus uh, uh, Bw. And uh, in this clear length of the panel, of course, we have taken this in the opposite, uh, the, in the perpendicular to this plane. Uh, the span is going to be 5 meter and uh, we have taken the width of your uh, cross uh, girder as 0.2 so the center to center panel length is taken as 5 meter minus 0.2 so that is basically so it should be 4.8 meters so 4.8 then this factor that the effective width the dispersion factor k is function of your b by l uh, here in this case the b is your span okay that is 4.8 and uh, this is your this because you are calculating dispersion in the perpendicular to the uh, the plane that what your view view right so that is basically your 1.84 and uh, you substitute that and uh, the table annexure uh, b of irc 112 gives you the dispersion factor for the slab in the perpendicular direction not is not along this uh, span direction so along the perpendicular direction what is the effective width that is distributing that is calculated and uh, for the ratio that what we got b by l of 1.8 we are finding this is a continuous slab we are designing so this value is going to be 2.6 so if you substitute that uh, value then you get your effective width of the slab in the perpendicular direction to be 5.17 uh, meter and then that total load then you divide it by that so basically that works out to be a uniformly distributed load of 67.61 kilonewton meter of course that is uh, acting over the span of uh, this okay so this is the load so, so shear when you're calculating now the 61.67 is acting over this 2.6 meter span but with the cg of 0.75 so if you have to calculate your shear we know that if your w is at the center a load that is acting in a simply supported beam at a distance of a then your reaction is going to be wb by l so that's exactly the same thing that you're doing so you calculate your shear as this that works out to be 47.48 kilonewton meter again you multiply for impact factor which is 1.25 so you get your shear force per meter length of slab as 59.32 kilonewton per meter then you keep going so that with that we have calculated demands for the live load so now uh, dead load bending moments and shear is basically uh, straightforward already we calculate this per meter square uh, what is the dead load that is for 250 mm slab with 100 mm bearing port we calculated that to be 8.2 kilonewton per meter square so you multiply that by the area panel area which is 5 meters by 2.8 then you get the total load as 114.8 kilonewton and because the panel is now uniformly distributed load uh, we have to use a different uh, pigot's curve so that is again it is given for uniformly distributed go so for coefficient m1 and m2 we use the value k and 1 by k so you get your k value which is b by l which is 2.8 by 5 and then you take the inverse of it that is your coefficient when you calculate mu. for 1.75 is used for this calculation of moment m2 and k factor is used for calculation of m1 so you get your span moment as this uh, from this coefficient which is 0.048 uh, times your total load is 114.8 kilonewton per meter and this poisson's ratio is basically 0.15 and then you multiply with the m2 so you get your short span moment uh, as 5.75 kilonewton meter and long span moment obviously is going to be lesser 
So that is going to be 1.65 kilonewton. Of course, you can see here for slab, your live load contributions are much larger than your dead load contribution. But if you go to the girder, it will it will it will work out to be uh, different. So uh, then you get your uh, shear force as this. So then finally we sum all the moments, and then now my demands are got. Okay. Now all I need to do is make sure that whatever for the depth that we have taken. Uh, which is 250 mm i need to calculate the amount of steel uh, that is what i use that uh, expression for your mu limit so once you fix your mu limit of course okay again you have to multiply by the load factors as per the load factors dead load load factors are 1.35 and live load uh, load factors are 1.5 so you substitute uh, these load factors and you multiply it so total uh, moment demand is for the short span is working out to be 61.47 and long span is working out to be 22.63 shear is again uh, you again do the same thing because this is per meter and you unfactor it so you factor it 1.35 1.5 a total shear i have to design this slab okay these are all only for slabs so once you get all these things of course we have found that the mu limit equation is 0.134 fck bd square now i got my moment as uh, 61.47, I put in this here and then get my, uh, because we are calculating for one meter width, so it is, B is going to be 1000 and slab concrete strength is 30 megapascal, so I take 30 and effective depth is working out to be 120. Now you can ask me, so the effective depth is only 123, so then why did you go for 250, okay? So we did the trials, we found that you need the depth for shear. Okay, you people usually think that slabs uh, shear will not control, but in bridges it's not so because you have that huge point load which is distributed over a small area, then the shear will start controlling, right? So, like I said, uh, if you take D is 200 and overall depth of 250 mm with some clear cover and so on, and uh, that is why we are going for 250 mm slab thickness. So, then you find that MVBD square is this, and uh, of course, you can use your. Uh, fundamental principles to calculate the reinforcement. You need only nominal reinforcement for flexure. That is 751.6 millimeters per. So if I assume 12 mm bar, so I, I need to provide it about uh, uh, 120 mm center for the longer span, it also to be 10 mm bar at 150 mm. So again, if you see here, uh, again, you know, so although the center to center distance is only 160, so just to be on the safer side, we want to keep the same uh, diameter of uh, spacing of 120 mm on either side. Again, you go ahead and back calculate your check, the provided check. So we find that 75 is much larger than 60, though we put very little amount of steel. Now comes the shear. Okay. Usually slabs, we think that it's not uh, dominant for shear, but not for bridges. Okay. We have to be very careful. Uh, this is the expression that is given. So shear resistance is uh, has a lot of factors. Okay. And uh, the uncracked concrete contributes in shear. And uh, your double action of the rebar that is connecting the crack to portion that will also contribute to shear resistance. Okay. And uh, uh, your aggregate interlock. Okay. Because the cracks are not always smooth. Okay. So there is a lot of shear transfer across between the cracked surfaces. So that is also going to contribute to shear resistance. The code uh, people have done a lot of experiment and they've come up with this simplified expression to accumulate all these factors and give you a simplified expression. Okay. And also, there is, a, if you see, that is why you see here, FCK is directly, it's it's very well known. Higher the strength of concrete, higher will be the shear. Now, there is also one factor called rho 1 or rho L, depending upon how you look at it. It is basically the amount of steel, tension steel. Okay. Higher the amount of tension steel, then higher will be the double resistance. Okay. That is why the rho L is there. Higher the amount of tension steel, then you will get. So, you find that, and there is one more factor called capital K. Okay. Usually, the slab is thinner then it will start transferring the load in membrane action. That means the slab can stretch in, uh, in plane. Okay, So that will offer a lot of resistance. So the code is also accumulated. And same way, when the slab is becoming thicker and thicker, then the resistance will come down. So size effect also will come down. So the code recognizes that, and that is why it is giving you this factor D. Higher the depth, more than 200, you know, this factor will go uh, less. Okay, there, there is a membrane effect. Okay, so in this case, you know, if you're putting effective depth as 200 mm, then you this K factor is to be one. Then when you multiply this in this equation, then you will find that uh, you will find that this, uh, uh, you know, even if you put 250 mm slab with a good amount of steel, you find that it is just adequate in shear. So that is why it's very important for slabs 
you know, in buildings, you know, the uh, unless it's a flat slab where you have a two-way shear, then you have to be really worried. Otherwise, one-way shear doesn't really control. But in bridges, it's not so. Even here, you see that even here, you know, the one-way shear itself is quite close. So you have to be careful when you go for a slab design. Okay, now uh, we have done with the slab. Now let's let me just quickly uh, spend some time uh, on how do we design the longitudinal girders. Okay, now this slab portion is done. Okay, now let us see how to design this uh, the main longitudinal girder. That is a major part, right? So that is a major one that is taking all the loads and transferring to the supporting columns. Okay, now. So what we use is, of course, nowadays, you know, we are, people are using finite element analysis, you know, good tools are from MIDAS and so many other tools are available. Uh, we can use these tools to put the uh, load placing according to the low, uh, according to the vehicle that you're choosing and we can do the analysis. But uh, always in, when you're using softwares, you have to be very careful about the results because if you're not careful enough, your results can be off quite a bit. So always it's better to do calculations using your simple manual calculations of proven methods. Uh, again, you know, there are a lot of methods are available, but the one of the simplest method that is available for distribution of loads uh, uh, to the longitudinal girders is a Kurban's method. Uh, that is a Kurban's method of load distribution. So what it, uh, what it really assumes is because and now what we have to do is we have to position these loads, right? At different spacings to see what is the uh, maximum bending moment and reaction. In Kurban's method, what is this? Is, you know, you you have you are basically you are connecting these longitudinal girders by cross girders. First of all, the cross girders have to be quite stiff, okay, to make sure that the assumptions of Kurban methods are valid, okay. And uh, what here we are really doing here is the reaction RI of the cross beam on any girder, okay. What it is because these are connected by the cross girders, right? So when the slabs are transferring the load, the, then the cross girders are going to uh, put some reaction on these main girders. So at Every five meter now we've kept the cross girders. So at every five meter, this longitudinal girder is going to receive the point load, okay, as a reaction. So, so but how much reaction will will the will the beam receive is basically function of what is the eccentricity of the wheel load placing that we are taking. So what we are assuming is due to this eccentric wheel load placing, because the cross girders are considered to be quite stiff, what we are saying is, is the entire system is not going to act individually. The entire thing is going to act as a system. So the entire thing is going to deflect. Okay. Okay. So if there is no, uh, there is a center load, obviously, then everything is going to go down symmetrically. But because it's an eccentric load, what the Purvan's method is, uh, Purvan has assumed is basically you're going to have a linear distribution of your deflection in the transverse direction. Okay, so the entire system is going to deflect basically like in a linear. Of course, because I'm having eccentric load here, so that is why the for the farthest girder is going to deflect more. Okay, so that's going to be deflection because it just carry over all the deflection, right? So the deflection at this point is going to be much larger than what you're having it on the on the other side, right? So uh, basically, we are assuming a linear variation of your deflections in the transverse direction. And this deflection, of course, is going to be maximum on the exterior girder on the side where you have an eccentric load that you have considered. Obviously, you know, we design for this one critical load and we put the same reinforcement for all the girders because the positions of loads can vary, right, in a bridge. It's not that, you know, the vehicles will follow uh, exactly along this particular line like that, right? So, what are the assumptions? Again, you know, in Kurban theory, the cross beams or diaphragms are assumed to be infinitely stiff, okay? And because of all these assumptions, again, uh, the demand what is being estimated from Kurban's method usually will be conservative, okay? And if you're using uh, your um, mm. grid line analysis, okay, using your frame element and your position load, you will find that the or the demands what you're getting for your girders will be relatively less compared to that of Kurban's method, okay? Um, again, so due to rigidity of the deck, concentrated load and instead of making the nearby girder or girder deflected, now everything will move down as a system and how much it is moving down basically depends upon the location of your concentrated load or the group of loads that what you're considering for your analysis. Okay. Of course, when you have a single concentric load applied right in the middle, then everything will move similar man manner, right? All the, all the girders, the deflection will be same. But because we are considering eccentric load because of the wheel placement, we'll find that 
the deflection of the all the girders will not remain same and the outer girder will be deflecting more in a linear profile and now the reaction that the girder is going to see is proportional to the deflection of the girder for the wheel placement so that is what we have to include now you have four girders so somehow as a system i have to consider the equivalent stiffness and then the relative stiffness of this particular member in proportion to the deflection to the overall stiffness of all the members that are connecting at this uh, together okay so these are all uh, some of the points so we have to make sure that for this analysis the longitudinal girders at least are connected by at least five cross girders one at center and two at the ends and two at one point and the depth the depth of the cross girder should be at least 75% of the depth of your longitudinal girder so that you, you create a very stiff system so that all the individual girders will not act individually but will act as a one system and span to width ratio ideally has to be greater than 2 as specified in the class 21 uh, 1987 and uh, also usually you know if it is greater than 4 you get very close to that of grillage analysis you know usually what what is done uh, in the field again uh, again even with your uh, finite element analysis if you are slapped to the depth ratio is more than 4 then you your grader distribution of the reactions will Uh, moment what you calculate will come out work very close to uh, kurban's method calculations will come out very close to what you get from your finite element analysis right so anyway so we we'll look at this uh, example again now how the reaction uh, is basically again it is this p is your uh, let's say if your total live load for example in this case if i'm taking it as uh, let's say uh, 70 ton load so total load is going to be uh, if one side one wheel i'm taking two wheels is 70, 70 ton three sides 350 350 on one side the w1 is going to be 350 kilo newton right and the moment and usually we will have the same uh, cross section for all the longitudinal girders so the moment of inertia for the beams are going to be same okay so if you uh, the, so the reaction for each girder from the cross girder will be proportional to the deflection right so of course uh, so that is function of basically this equation that p into i if i am considering a deflection for let's say for this beam so that means the load will be 350 for one side right 350 times the moment of inertia of this beam divided by now i have four supporting beams so this will become 4i 4 times the moment of inertia of all the girders right times 1 plus now the eccentricity of all the girders now which one will have higher eccentricity is so basically the load eccentricities live load is given here okay now b is basically the distance of the girder okay from the cg what is the distance of the girder is basically given by your bi in this equation so larger is the distance from the cg okay higher will be your reaction coefficient from what it is going to come from your uh, from your cross girder okay so if you look at it those so this equation will become i by 4i this also you will have 4i and this will become i times d square of all the girders okay so of course i is going to be same so you can take it out and only the d is going to be different for all the girders so you can substitute it and you can find your coefficients for your uh, beams now now if the if the girder is going to be exactly in the middle let's say you have five girders obviously this coefficient is going to be zero right so so that is what it is right so for this uh, example that what we have considered so we are going to assume this wheel load distribution to be like this because we know the spacing between these tracked wheels is 2.05 meter now if you take the centroid of this load so w1 is 350 and this is also 350 so because total load what we are considering is 700 tons now that is going to act at a cg of exactly right in the middle between these two loads so i am considering this wheel position uh for maximum uh, eccentricity because i need to consider the maximum eccentricity right so we are taking uh, such kind of thing so because we are looking at for uh, one of the girder what is the maximum reaction and then whatever the demand that we are getting we are going to use it for all the girders right so uh, so this is basically design of the longitudinal girders of course so this is the equation that i told you so w1 so total load is basically 700 uh, kilo newton so it is going to be two times w1 and now we have four girders so it's going to be four and now if you look at it for outer girder a so that's what we have taken this as a if i'm taking it uh, this as my outer girder okay so because my eccentricity is now here on this side so that is why i'm taking it maximum reaction is going to be for this girder a so i'm going to take this uh, reaction so of course four girders are the four 
so then you substitute that you get uh, distance uh, now symmetrical distances are there for two girders so that is a two girders are at a 4.2 distance and two girders are at 1.4 distance so you substitute that you get an expression for rea as 0.32 times w1 now of course w1 is 350 kilonewton okay so similarly, you can calculate the reaction factor for the inner girder also. That works out to be 0 0.611 times uh, W1. And uh, the total axial load W is, of course, P is taken as total axial load, which is 350 kilonewton. That's why W1 is taken as half of that axial load, which is uh, 350 kilonewton. So you get your reaction as uh, basically um, uh, 0.416 W and uh, reaction, because now this is... Uh, uh, reaction the actual value is from the total load right so that is working out to be 0.416 w and 0.306 w and uh, now we have calculated these uh, uh, reactions from live load okay of course the girder is also going to now see the dead loads from the wearing coat from the slab and the girder itself so all these things we need to calculate so now we are calculating the dead loads okay so the dead load for each uh, from slab for each girder is uh, calculated like this. These are the dimensions that we have assumed initially, right? So we take uh, one meter uh, RC post with some assumed loads and then curve of 300 by 1500, right? And then so on. So you calculate the parapet railing as a lump sum load of, let's say, 0.92 kilo. These are usually proprietary systems. So depending upon what you're using, so the loads are given by the supplier. So you take 0.92 kilo another meter and footpath and curve. Uh, you multiply 300 times 1.5 meter by 24, so you get your loads. And deck slab load is, we know that for each panel it is 1.25 uh, is the thickness, and then you multiply with uh, uh, this uh, 1.5 times 24, then you get your uh, 20 kilonewton per uh, uh, meter. And uh, total dead load of the in deck, including both sides. So now we are doing it only for this side, right? So now we have to do for both sides. So that works out to be 2 into 20 plus 8.2. Now this, this slab also we have to take. Initially, we calculated that to be 8.2 kilonewton per meter square. That I'm multiplying by the total width of carriageway. That is 8.4 meter. That is my total load that is working out to be 108.88 kilonewton meter. And uh, this all the dead load, because now we have four longitudinal girders, we are going to distribute them and I assume that it is going to be shared equally by all the uh, four girders. So total dead load for girders works, working out to be 27.22 kilonewton per meter. And, uh, and now the big question is, of course, you know, I told you this, this 2.1 we got, okay. So that is basically coming from 35 meters span for each meter, then you multiply by points uh, uh, 60 mm or 0.06, I should say, right? Then you get uh, uh, 2,100 uh, mm or 2.1 meter. Overall depth we can finalize. Now, how to finalize this, uh, uh, the bottom flange width? And of course, now portion of the deck slab will act, okay? Now, usually the girders will be coming like this with some shear doubles. Then you cast the slab so that everything is going to act as a one uniform number okay so for the spacing that we have assumed so that uh, effective width of the slab is working out to be 1.2 meter and uh, i have chosen 500 mm because we have done some trials we found that the precessing force required is quite high at the mid span so i need to accommodate almost up to six cables here uh, so that is why i have taken 500 mm here so this i again like i told you design is an iterative process so only some bare minimum parameters you assume with then you keep revising it according to the uh, the requirement that you have okay so dead load of the main girders again you know like i said to 2100 mm we worked out with uh, 60 mm of course this can be further reduced also i'm not saying 2100 is a final number i have taken this number uh, if you're going to reduce this obviously your other uh, moment of inertia has to be increased okay to satisfy the stress limits then you may end up providing larger uh, web width larger uh, flanges you know and so on okay but uh, we know that the deflection and for pre stressing higher the depth, I get higher the eccentricity, right? So that is why I've chosen, okay, slightly even if it is higher, that's fine. So I've taken 2.1 2, 2 meter. And uh, again, the bottom flange is selected such that four to see six cables can be easily accommodated in the flange. Like I said, uh, you know, bottom flange, you, you know, in I section, why it is structurally efficient? 
one is uh, for pre stressing you can accommodate lot more cables second thing is i am also by plan section i make i am i am moving the cg right with this dex lab also now cg will moving up so that is good for me especially for uh, synthesis supported system now you'll get higher eccentricity that is possible okay higher the eccentricity now the force required to uh, satisfy your stress limits will come down so those, that is the idea so anyway so now this can the section can be idealized this like this for simplifications then you calculate your cg and so on and then you get your uh, total weight of the girder itself like this that what's out to be 7.68 kN per meter so uh, then and uh, finally now we got everything so we get your reaction from dex lab on each girder as uh, 27.22 kN meter that we have calculated previously right and weight of the cross girder also we we found i have taken 1.6 meter so now you can ask me why did you take 1.6 meter you have seen that in kurban's method we need to take this as 0.75 times the overall depth of your the longitudinal girder so because i have taken 2100 So 0.75 times 2,100, you know, at least it works out to be 1.6 meter. So it's sufficiently to be rigid, so that the entire system is going to act as one unit. So that is the idea that I've taken that is 1.6 meter, and uh, the weight of the cross girder is uh, a little higher, and the reaction of these girders is going to be now every 2.8 meter. Uh, it is it is going to support, so it's going to have 21.5 uh, kilonewton per meter is the load that is. coming on this because of this and self weight of the girder itself we have done the calculation that is 11.16 so that is 11.16 now you need to add all of them right total load is working out to be 38.98 kN meter now these are the reactions that are coming from your cross girders all these things are reaction that is coming from your cross girders right so for the uh, the one girder okay that what we calculated Now for this one, uniformly distributed load is known. The point load that is coming from the cross girder is known, and anyway the beam is simply supported, so you can use your simple uh, statics, and you can get your maximum moment. Okay, and similarly I can get my maximum shear that is working out to be seven hundred and forty-seven kilonewton, and moment is this. Okay, so we do that. Now for the live load flow placing, of course, if I want maximum moment in the mid span, I have to put. Uh, Uh, the, the the width of 3.6 meter uh, load right has to be kept in the middle and you develop your influence line diagram so for this you know for a unit load you get a moment magnitude of 8.75 right and so now i have a distributed load for a entire width of 3.6 meter so what we do is we take an average of these coefficients and we multiply because this and this right so average is going to be somewhere here so i take average of this and this so this is my average value and multiply by the total load to get my moment okay so you do the same thing and uh, so i've taken this uh, influence line diagram again of course for the beams impact factor is working out to be 10 percentage so you take the bending moment as this uh, half of so that's why we take 7.85 plus 8.75 you know you divide by uh, this uh, by 2 uh, you take by 2 half you get And multiply by the 700 uh, kilonewton is the total load that is coming from the uh, tractor vehicle. So you get a moment from live load of 5,810 kilonewton meter. Okay. So again, you multiply with 1.1 for impact factor. Now the factor for this girder we have calculated that to be 0.416 live load uh, factor. Okay. So now the reaction factor we have calculated using Kurban's method, right? So that is working out to be 0.416. So you multiply by that. This is your live load bending moment from the vehicle load placing, right? For inner girders again, that coefficient is going to be less. So it is working out to be 1956 kilonewton meter, right? So you get your moments, and then we proceed with the shear. Now for shear, because it's a simply supported beam, again the wheels have to be placed very close to that of support to get the higher shear. So we place the spacing. Of course, spacing between these stacked vehicles is kept as 2.05 meter, and each of this uh, point load, if you sum the load, it is going to be 350 kilonewton. Then you assume uh, uh, reactions of uh, W2 on this girder. Okay, you calculate similarly. You calculate the reaction of W2 on the girder A. Then because now the shear demand for B and A is going to be different, right? So we calculate. Though we are going to use the same design for this, we are just uh, you know calculating the reactions to find what is the total load that is coming on the uh, girder B. 
okay so you add them up so initially you had uh, uh, this uh, 350 plus uh, the 94 that it devoted is coming the reaction so the total load on the girder is going to be 444 kilonewton uh, and then similarly the maximum reaction in girder b is going to be 444 now we know the position of this right so this fellow is acting now the total length is 35 meter now this point load is acting because this width is we know that that is basically uh, 3.6 meter right so it is going to be at 1.8 meter so 35 minus uh, 1.8 is 33.2 so this is the load that is acting so uh, that uh, again from simple statistics so if you know load and you know this a and b we know that the reaction is going to be w times b divided by l so that's how we get my reaction on your girder b because of the uh, this load and similarly uh, again we do the same thing for 256 kilonewton because that this is the load that is coming here so 256 times 33.2 divided by 35 gives you 243 kilonewton and now maximum live load shear again what we do we we multiply with impact factor to get your uh, shear that works out to be 463 kilonewton and outer girder is uh, 267 kilonewton but anyway we just we don't distinguish it uh, but whatever the design that we get for your outer girder that's the same thing that we are going to use right so uh, finally when you summarize all of them you get your dead load bending moment as this live load bending moment as this and total bending moment you work out to be it's almost 9273 uh, kilonewton meter and if you look at the shear is also for outer girder for inner girder is going to be shear is going to be high so that is going to be because now inner girder shear will down but what we do is when we design it we design take the shear uh, from, from the inner girder analysis and the moment from the outer girder analysis and we do the same thing for all the girder. okay we don't distinguish uh, shear design and moment the, the designs for outer girder and inner girder. So finally, so these are the uh, section dimensions. Uh, uh, you know, these are the properties of the section. So you can just pure geometry calculation. You calculate the area uh, by discretizing the discretizing them as uh, rectangles, and you get your uh, moment of uh, inertia and centroidal distance. And you can see here because I have a wider flange here. Now what I do is I have CG is not at the center, it has moved up. In fact, that is going to help me because I'm going to put a lot of precessing steel here. For precessing steel, higher is this eccentricity, the better it is, right? So that is why having a wide flange section at the top at mid span, it is actually helpful, okay? So uh, that is helpful for me. So you calculate your moment of finish, your section modulus at the top and bottom, and you do all these uh, simple calculations. Now, what is the way we are, we are targeting a type one design. So that means both the transfer as well as at service, I cannot have any tensile stresses. Okay. So these stress limits are given as zero. My total moment is now 9,273. Okay. Now you see here, you know, a quick calculation will give you an idea that almost if you look at it, you know, by adopting the loss factor eta, and uh, you know what is the stress that is produced by the moment quickly because we have done a type one design there is not going to be any cracking right so m divided by z uh, section modulus will give me what is the stress so you can see here almost i am creating a tensile stress of 30.38 mega pascal at the bottom okay because of this total moment now how can i relieve all the stress only by putting free stress from p by a plus p times e divided by z so these two comp components i make sure that i design p a section modulus and eccentricity in such a way that i am going to nullify all this tension because finally i need to have zero tensile stress at the bottom so i choose all these components to make sure that i release all these tensile stresses to make it zero now how do we do that again you know uh, more uh, Appropriate means, of course, you can quickly use this Magnell's graphical method. Uh, we talked about it right in the beginning. We can develop these equations, four equations for four stress inequalities. And I can, for a particular chosen dimension, I can select P0 and E in such a way that my section design is going to be within the section, right? So that is a quick way of checking whatever. That's why I said in pre stress, we design for serviceability to make sure that the stresses are within the limit. Then we go ahead and check whether the reinforcement that what we have provided is good or not for ultimate strength, right? So we do this, 
uh, again, you know, by uh, making sure whatever they you know from simplifications, we can find out that the section modulus what we have provided is less than uh, what is required is actually much lesser than what we have provided. So the section dimensions are adequate. So uh, again, moving forward, probably I'll take uh, another five more minutes. I know I'm rushing things. I'm sorry because we have to uh, finish a little quickly. Um, yeah, so now the coming, you know, uh, how much is the precessing uh, force and how do we put it for maximum possible eccentricity? Now, you see your section dimension give me 1214 millimeter, and I'm assuming, okay, I'm going to have the effective cover of 200 mm, so that leaves me an eccentricity of about 1014 millimeter. Uh, now, from the stress limits, I can put it, uh, calculate the force, okay, because this is the tension force that we are. I said because of the total load that is coming. So I can uh, put this and calculate what is the, for the assumed section models, what is the precessing force that is required. So you see that that works out to be 8,250 kilonewton. So 8,250 kilonewton is a quite a big force, right? So that we are basically putting it all uh, right there in the bottom. So that is why while you apply pre-stress, you need to be careful, not only for tension, but also for compression. We have to satisfy the stress limits. So uh, that we need to be careful, right? So uh, anyway, so here in this case, uh, you know, I've just adopted a 0.6 inch strand, uh, seven wire uh, strand, uh, 15 mm diameter, and usually that, that can be accommodated in 65 mm duct, and the uh, area of uh, force in each cable, we take it to be for each cable is 260.7, and we take 80% of that as a limit, so uh, that works out to be 1459 kilometer. Now the total force required is 8250, by this, then you know exact number is 5.5, .5, but I cannot put 5.5 .5 cables. I have to go to the next round number, that is six cables. So actual cable that is uh, force that is put is six times 1459. Uh, that can be worked out for area in each stand is 140 mm square, and the total area that what I'm providing is 5880 mm square like this. Okay, I need to have and we are, we are looking eccentricity as the group of this. Okay, somewhere here. Right, so that is your overall eccentricity that when you do, right. So let me keep going again. You know, permissible tendon zone uh, at support also. Now what we do is we 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 splay the support because that's where we are stressing. Now I cannot stress all this force only at one location. I need to splay the tendons in such a way that the stress concentrations can be reduced. So that again we can check. Like uh, I explained you right in the beginning, what are the limiting zones? So just by putting these limits, uh, we can calculate what are the maximum allowable values for your eccentricities. So that works out to be 366 and minus 4, minus 450 means basically it's above the CGC, right? So it gives you a good range within which I can splay the cables. So this is the uh, splaying of the cable that uh, for six cables that are, that has been worked out. Um, and we, we are arranging it to have an eccentricity of about 164 mm at the support. Uh, you know, below the, just below, because this is at the support, okay, not at the, because this is the anchoring zone, okay, uh, not at the mid-span. Mid-span, of course, all of them will be here, right at the bottom, right? So, uh, we keep going, I think, uh, yeah, so again, uh, finally, we have looked at all this. Now, we have come up with the dimensions, we have come up with the pre-stressing force. Now, finally, again, we have to go back and check, because, you know, uh, these forces sometimes, instead of 5.5 .5 cables, now you put a little higher, right, 6 cables, right? So we have to check the stress limits. So you get all this uh, standard values, compressive stress, moment due to pre-stress at the top, as well as at the bottom. Then you, uh, you check the stress values from the loads, that is dead load, uh, um, from the live loads, and then a transfer, then you put all of them, then you find that everything is in compression, there is no problem, right? And uh, you find that, uh, so again, uh, at the bottom, 17.12 uh, compression, we worked out to be 18 megapascal is allowable, so that is also fine. And the working load stage, you work out to be 13.73 in compression, and tension slightly, this uh, this fellow is slightly exceeding, uh, but, you know, 0.16 megapascal of tension is nothing, because your FCR itself is 0.7 square root of FCK. So, still, if you want, you can slightly modify it to make it exactly zero as well. So, but I think this is a very minor stress. So, so that means whatever the design that we have come up with this, okay. Now, finally, you go ahead and check for your ultimate strength. Uh, ultimate strength, uh, again, you know, uh, it's a straightforward process. You can use strength compatibility approach. And because it's a bonded system, so you're going to have nice strength compatibility between the uh, strand and the connecting concrete. 
so you can use kind compatibility and uh, this is the demand that we uh, we got right so about uh, 13000 kilonewton meter uh, now uh, we are looking at uh, uh, so this is the demand so and i need to make sure that at ultimate at least this much is there if pre stressing is not able to provide what i can do i can also augment the capacity by providing some non pre stress system so that also i can do so uh, because pre stressing like i said mostly we design the system for serviceable if i want little additional strength for ultimate i of course i can add with uh, some so these are simplified procedure you know approximate method that is given in is 1343 Uh, you can you can look at the table and it's anyway it's a singly reinforced section. I can quickly calculate uh, by 0.8 times 1860 as my thing, and uh, I can get my um, uh, reinforcement limits. And uh, it works out to be a few at the, for this condition uh, is x u and this is, these are the values. And then you plug in your traditional uh, bending moment capacity equations. Then you get your capacity to be fourteen thousand six seventy five, which is much larger than twelve thousand nine hundred seven. That's what we got. So flexibility, this is good. Now coming to shear, I think we we briefly we touched upon it in girders. Because of the cable profile, what will happen is you will have a horizontal component and a vertical component. The horizontal component will put the concrete in compression, that will increase the tensile strength, apparent tensile strength. But this vertical component will also will help me. It will reduce the shear demand. So that is the beauty with pre-stressing. This VP component will come. That will directly reduce my shear demand. So compared to RC reinforced concrete, where we don't get this VP, we rely only on a stir up on concrete strength. But here, by varying the cable profile, I can get a vertical component that will completely nullify the shear. Okay. So that is the beauty of this VP because VP is directly proportional to your P times theta. Okay, sine theta. Because the theta is going to be cable profile is going to be very very small. If I have a very sharp theta, then I can basically create a huge amount of VP. So that is a, a big plus with uh, pre-stress concrete for shear also. That is why we are able to go impact even a thinner web. Again, uh, maybe we do the lack of time. I would uh, uh, just any anyway, internal resistance we have compared to RC uncracked concrete will help in shear. Aggregate interlock because the crack is not smooth. So When you have a crack forming, there's going to be a lot of friction that will be generating. So that is going to create this frictional resistance. So that will give you in shear. Now these longitudinal bars that are basically connecting this cracked surface, right? So that is also basically going to bridge these cracks. So that is also going to give you this BD. All of them are combined together. That's what the code is giving you this expression. Again, I told you in pre-stress uh, because we are putting pre-stress. Now you will end up with a shallower crack angle compared to us because now I have a horizontal component, normal stress that will basically make the crack shallow. In fact, if I make the crack shallower, uh, it is uh, it is it is it's actually I can I can play with uh, I can reduce the quantity of stir up. Okay, so that is that is also possible. In fact, that is what Mr. Umesh was talking about the vari variable angle truss model. Using variable angle truss model, I can I can basically uh, reduce the uh, shear. Uh, reinforcement required okay this is again traditional process we need to make sure that the shear resistance is more than shear demand and uh, one one thing that uh, we get benefit is this vp okay the vp will basically add to shear resistance or it will reduce the demand you know uh, so this vp in fact if you are reducing the shear demand then what you do is vu minus vp okay or if you are if you are not reducing the shear demand what you can do is you can add to the capacity either way we can we can account for it and this value can be quite huge in a pre-stress system so uh, that is very very beneficial uh, for a pre-stress system so we checked it i think again you know uh, due to lack of time probably i'll just run through it uh, you find that the the reinforcement whatever the capacity is almost 2775 kN because this fellow itself is quite a huge value okay so this is what i said vp okay so this vp value itself is quite high that's going to augment your uh, normal shear capacity so you get a quite a good resistance and you find that it is uh, even the concrete itself is sufficient to uh, for the shear demand um, so for this particular section so but anyway for a piece of section we just put some nominal stirrups uh, usually because the webs are thin we try to put two like the stirrups Uh, of a 10 mm diameter at a standard spacing of 300 mm, then finally you come up with these kind of dimensions, and uh, so yeah, you you just put the stirrups, 
and one thing again while you are stressing you have to be very very careful if you are not careful about this uh, uh, you are going to develop lot of this tensile stresses in the anchorage zone so you need to put lot of steel and we have standard methods for calculating this bursting tensile stresses again irc also gives you guideline on that uh, maybe i think uh, due to lack of time uh, i will uh, just uh, you know i will share the slides uh, uh, the pdf copy of the slides so you can look at it and uh, this is also standard procedure i can calculate what is the bursting force that is coming accordingly i can calculate the uh, the area of steel that is required to resist this uh, shear i again like i said like i told you we try to play the stress stressing cable okay so that you know your uh, stress concentration is not seen so that is what that limiting zone also i told you e max and e minimum at the support location so you try to splice them uh, so splay the cables in such a way that the stress concentrations are reduced right so finally we come up with this kind of a design uh, and uh, yeah so again cross girders are uh, you know it just to to give you lateral stability to the beam and to make this slab as a one way slab and uh, you try to keep uh, 75 percentage of your overall depth of the beam as your depth of your cross girder and we can keep a very minimum width of 200 mm anyway these cross girders are nicely uh, laterally uh, restrained by the longitudinal girders so you don't need to have a very wide width so you keep that and you put some nominal reinforcement and some nominal precessing steel uh, to make sure that they are happy right so anyway so quickly i just reviewed basic design concepts and we went through an example problem how to design uh, from slabs girders and cross girders and little bit about how to design the uh, precessing cable knowledge is always increasing and we always share so on that note uh, of sharing i want to start this presentation uh, today's talk is just about a small talk on box culverts they are very important uh, structures they are so so numerous and they are the most recurring structure on a highway project uh, so i want to talk to you about that uh, and also on railway line uh, so i want to talk to you about that and talk to you in the terms of the use of it in the irc 112 code so the contents uh, are the introduction where is types of box culverts something about them components of box culverts uh, the design principles the loads the critical sections which we examine for moment and shear then a design example which i have taken from a very good book which i'll tell you in the end and reinforcement details of a typical box culvert uh, i i would share with you and i have told dr busari also that i will share with all of you participants a live uh, bombay Delhi uh, Expressway, Mumbai Delhi Expressway project, uh, on which there is a, a, a box culvert which we have uh, proof checked, and I have all the stat files, the design, and everything to share with all the participants, including the detailed design and drawings, which I will send to Mrs. Uh, to Dr. Busari, and she will share them with all of y'all, uh, and form of PDF uh, as a real case that is constructed. Yeah. So there are various types of box culverts. Typically, you know, bridges more than six meters. Box culverts invariably are less than six meters unless they are multi-cell. They allow water to pass through across the highway stuck across the highway, or sometimes they allow vehicles to go from below in the box and or pedestrians to go in below in the box. So that's a typical idea for box. A culvert usually is for passage of water. Uh, that's uh, the way we convert. Uh, call them as pipe culverts if it were a pipe. A box culvert if it had a box. Maybe an old arch type culvert, uh, or maybe just a slab across the floor or the waterway, uh, which expands. So they can be of different types: arches uh, or a slab allowing water to pass through. Maybe for human beings to go across, or the, you know, small vehicles to pass through, or they may be multi-cell, as you see here. And the typical components are like this: there's the road above, and we have uh, say wing walls to hold back the earth and And uh, the backfill for for the road and and so on uh, the roadway. Uh, whereas here you can see we design this in terms of per meter run. So various sections you see they may be making it in sections and integrating them. So usually the design is done per meter run uh, of this uh, uh, box culvert that you see. Uh, a hydraulic design has already been discussed with you in detail. Uh, that's the discharge that will be having to be done, and the hydraulic design already been discussed in the earlier sessions. I will concentrate today on structural design. Uh, we will deal with uh, concentrated loads, uh, uniformly distributed loads, weight of the side walls, water pressure inside the culvert, earth pressure on vertical side walls, and uniform lateral load on the side walls due to surcharge. Typical concentrated loads, as you know, it spreads. It spreads say at 45 degrees in both directions. 
and sometimes if there are wheels which are close by, they may overlap. Ma'am, can I get a pointer here? It's annotated, right? Uh, is it spotlight that I? No, sir. Say? No, sir. It's not yet. No, no. You have. Uh, you have to. You have to pick up a pointer, sir. Sir, you can right click and choose a pointer. So from there, you are able to. Right click and. Uh, yes. Yes. There. Use a pointer. Okay. Yes. Right. Click. So here you see the dispersion of the load at 45 degrees. Sometimes the vehicles may be so close that they overlap and we shall consider such situations also. Uh, the uniformly distributed load, well, you have, uh, uh, if you have an overburden or you have a cushion, what we call them, there's the density of the earth and the gamma D and you get a uniform. And at the bottom, of course, you get a base pressure. Similarly, you get uh, the weight of the side walls, which act on the bottom. The, the, the walls themselves add a load and it gives another component to the base pressure. And that is typically based upon the thickness and the density of the concrete of the side walls. And we get that. Then you also have the water pressure, which might be flowing as a full water pressure inside the culvert flowing full. It will be triangular on the side walls, whereas on the bottom, it will be as a UDL as gamma W into H, which gamma W is the density of water. Similarly, the earth pressure, which acts from the outside of the box, where D is the height of the cushion and H is the overall height, it will act as a pressure per meter square. But since we consider per meter run into paper, that is per meter depth into paper, uh, we consider into run into paper, this will become per meter in our design calculations. We design a box culvert per meter into paper, if you like. The next slide we have is about uniform lateral load on side walls. Uh, there's a clause in the code, and this is due to the surcharge. The live load will put a surcharge, which has to be taken uniformly based upon the soil pressure and the equivalent height, which we will discuss in the design example. What are the critical sections? Of course, moment and shear. So moment in the middle, moment at the edges where we have fixed end moments, central span where we have the sag moment in all four sides of the box. And of course, the critical shear sections are taken at D by two, uh, at, sorry, at D away from uh, the face uh, on each side. So for this member, it will be D away from here. For this member, it will be say D away from here and so on. Middle section for bending, middle section for bending. These sections out here for uh, uh, corner sections for um, negative moment or fixed end moments. If you like. Coming to the next, uh, I want to share with your design example. And a stepwise case, how we design these uh, uh, box culverts, we take trial dimensions, then we have load calculations, again, per meter length or per meter length into paper, uh, check for uh, the safe bearing capacity uh, on the soil, uh, that uh, the trace pressure is less than the safe bearing capacity, determination of clear cover and effective depth D, uh, critical section for design, then moment N and V due to different loads, uh, due to the various the earth pressure and so on, what are the loads that we get? Then load combinations, how we combine them for the different combinations and design of the various box cul box culvert elements for the ULS case and the SLS case. The SL ULS case using the basic combination of loads as per the IR IRC6, for which we use to design for flexure and shear, and serviceability, the rare combination of loads, which we consider for checking stresses in concrete and steel and for checking for deflection and the quasi permanent combination, which we use for checking of crack width. And of course, the detailing that where the reinforcement goes and how the detailing looks and where we provide what in the drawing. So let's take a case uh, of a box colored of four by four with class A8 crack vehicle. At the, the, the density of soil is 18 kilonewtons per meter cube. Soil uh, angle of internal friction is 30 degrees. The width of the bridge deck is 8.7. Safe bearing capacity is 120 kilonewtons per meter square. M30 grade concrete and FP415 steel. The direction of traffic, and if we cut in the direction of traffic, we have uh, uh, this uh, direction, and across the direction of traffic, we have 8.7. If we take a cross section, this is the 8.7. We have a wall of 0.42 thick, this wall of 0.42 thick, parapets of 0 0.6, 0 0.6 on each side, and a clear category of 0.7, and a mastic asphalt layer of 0 0.056 thick. And of course, we don't have any cushion. That is, this is directly resting. The traffic would run directly over it without a cushion. So this example is without any earth cushion above. That, that means there's no embankment or so above it. It is almost level with the road from the other side. So there is no cushion taken in this example. 0.42 thick are the thickness of the walls all around. 
uh, that is 0.426 millimeters. All these dimensions are meters. We have to convert to millimeters later. And four is the uh, dimensions, four by four is the dimension of the inside of the box or where, where the water will flow. So 4.63 is the outer dimension. Uh, the center line then on which all our design calculations will be done, the center line is 4.42 by 4.42. That's the center line dimensions of the box. The load calculations then, uh, if we consider the load calculations, checking with the empty colored condition when the water is not flowing, we get the uh, wall that the, we, it's a very simple self weight of the slab and then the total weight of the slab based upon the density and the thickness uh, we get the total weight of the slab and then the total weight of each wall is of course the same in this case because they're both four and they're they're all same dimensions and the total weight you see here the two the two weights of the walls converted to point loads and the udl self weight of, of that one and then therefore the base pressure that develops at the base considering this is four walls of 46 divided by this dimension, outer dimension of the center line, that is 442, which is 42. That is 442 is the 4.42 is the center line dimension. Then the weight of the wearing coat, of course, the wearing coat on top of 0 0.056, its density 22 kilonewtons per meter cube, and therefore its corresponding uh, uh, base pressure that is developed. Uh, similarly, for live load, we get a dispersion in both directions, in the x direction and in the width direction. So what we call the effective width BE is calculated. Here is the class track vehicle. It is put 1.2 kilometers from the edge. All this is as per IRC 6 guidelines, where to put it, how far to put it, etc. And you see here there's some overlap. So the L effective, that is the, the L effective, uh, we have to calculate the effective length and we have to calculate the effective breadth because it disperses in both directions. That is 3.6 in this direction. This is the this is the L effective direction. So the L effective is 3.6 plus 2 into 45 degrees to the uh, dispersion through the um, wearing coat uh, and 0.42 to the wall, uh, I mean, to the top slab. And that, of course, goes outside. This dimension is larger than 4.42, which is the center line dimension. So we restrict it to 4.42. The effective length is 4.42. Then the load acting on the culvert is, of course, uh, the load of this vehicle is 700 kilonewtons as per the IRC, divided by the uh, this dispersed uh, width uh, length that you have, uh, but restricted by this. So you get uh, this as the value of P to be considered. And A is the distance of center of gravity of the load from the nearest support, uh, which we consider, which is 4.42 divided by 2, this, this being the center, 4.42 divided by 2 is this distance, this being the support. And we get B, which is width of the slab, which is 8.7, this one, 8.7, and L is 4.42. Sorry. Yeah. And for... Ma'am, I have something on the top of my screen. Can that go away? The, the floating handle, can that be bought elsewhere? Okay, let me leave it there. So for B by L equals 8.7 by 4.42, which is 1.97. Yeah, for a continuous slab, here you have B by L naught or B by L. Okay, you look up this for a simple support slab for a continuous slab. All what you see in yellow are the extracts from the code which are relevant to our design example. I've extracted them from the code and put them here and in red you will find the reference to the clauses that are made so uh, you get for for 1.97 it's somewhere around here we can as well as take for alpha equals about uh, 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 sorry 1.97 that'll be around here alpha equals 2.6 so with this for continuous slab here, here you got the continuous slab 2.6 that's the value you get there. Then for effective width, alpha A, this is another formula that is given, alpha A into 1 minus A by L plus B1. B1 is through the 8.5, if you go back. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, this, this is, okay, there you are. It's, it started to work again. It got frozen for a minute, man. So, uh, if you uh, if if you consider the B effective, we, we calculate the B effective in both directions. That is, we calculate this is B effective that we want. This B effective, okay. This is B effective. The calculations are given for B effective, and we land up 
with a net effective width, okay, BE, as 5.8885. Eight, 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 5.885 is the B effective. This B effective is 5.885 because of this little overlap. So these calculations are given to you. You can have them. And this is the way the uh, dispersion is calculated in both directions. And we get the effective width and the effective length. Then, of course, the live load is the actual load uh, divided by this first uh, value divided by LEBE. We work both the LE and B out. We get this value of so much 26 kilonewton per meter square. Take the impact factor 1.25 from IRC code, IRC 6. That we multiply by this and we get the uh, with the impact factor the uh, uh, value to be considered. Based on that, the base pressure divided by the length, of course, we get the base pressure that we need UDL, UDL. Okay, that's the that, since that's the only load that we have uh, for this case for the wearing port or the asphalt surface, what you call, we have the base pressure developed. Next, we consider for the earth pressure. It's always taken earth pressure at rest because the clause of the code says that walls have to be designed as closed boxes as like this with K, K naught at rest. 1 minus sine phi, 30 degrees. We work that out. Density of soil is given as 18. So at the top of the slab where H equals 0.21 because it's a center line. At the center line, since this is a center line, always working on the center line, it is 0.423. So 0.21 and we work that out. And at the bottom of the slab, I, that's uh, 4.60 meters from the top. That's uh, the value you get for the base pressure. So 1.89 kilonewtons per meter at the top, per meter into paper. So per meter square per meter, that is 1.89 at the top and 4.6, 41.6 at the bottom. Similarly, we get a live load surcharge, which we discussed, and that is uh, to be taken as uniform. And that works out just based upon the height and the center line. We get the value over that on the side pressure so much as 10.8. Right, a, a simple question of taking the simple issue of taking K naught into sigma s into H equivalent. H equivalent height of soil is 1.2 meters because the top close clause in the code clearly says it should be 1.2 meters. We take that and we get the base pressure to be taken. Now check for the base pressure combining all those situations uh, for the running full condition. The water, the volume of water density, etc., will have 160 kilonewton. The base pressure due to it running full in full flood will be divided by the uh, center line distance at the base. So the water will put 36.2 kilonewtons per meter square base pressure. Total up all the base pressures due to the various cases and see that it is less than the safe bearing capacity of the soil, which we've got from our uh, uh, tests in the. Uh, It's okay. We don't have to increase the dimensions. The base pressure is uh, well within the SDC. That's safe. Uh, then we come to the determination of clear cover and the effective depth. Okay. Uh, as per this clause of the IRC, the minimum cover for all elements below ground should be 75 millimeters. So we are below ground. 75 millimeters shall be the clear cover for all reinforcements. Let us take a 20 meter diameter bar. Hence, the effective depth D is 420, which is the thickness of the slab minus 75, which is clear cover, minus half diameter. So D is 335 millimeters effective depth. Let us consider the critical sections then. Uh, having discussed that, let us now look at the critical sections which we need to consider for the design for a moment and then check for shear. So the elements are, all the four elements are designed for a moment and check for shear for ULS condition, okay? SLS I'll discuss separately. So the negative sections one, four, and seven are for the negative moments. Obviously, this section here uh, is one. This section here is seven. For this member, this will be the section we can consider. This section or this section the same. Uh, this one or this one the same. The, just at the inner face, okay. That is P by two away. This is the moment negative moment section. And for this one, of course, it is at uh, a section at uh, 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 seven. That is, you can see here. For, for this wall, it's at seven, okay? So we've got uh, all the critical sections for one, four, and seven for negative moment, okay? Uh, for this wall, it is four. For this one, it is seven. And for the, for the top slab, it is one. These are the negative moments. 
The positive moments, of course, are the central sections of each of these uh, items, that is 2, 6, and 8. And for shear sure force, we take it at D away from the face, that is at D away from each face, at D away from each face, we take the critical section to be checked for shear sure force. Okay. So these are the center line, the, the thickness 420 in each case at T by 2 is 200, and D plus T by 2 is this section from the center line would be a D plus T by 2 where we check the uh, shear. Let, uh, let us go for the M, V, and N due to different loads. Due to dead load, say we have used moment distribution. Today at Nevedita will show you how easily it is uh, doable in a software, and we don't have to break our heads doing moment distribution anymore. And due to dead load, we get a BMD, SFD, and AFD, that is uh, action force diagram, okay? The bedding moment, shear force, and action force diagrams, right? We get those. And we consider this section at T by 2 away and this section at T by 2 away. We will design each of the elements shortly. And these sections are important when we come to the design. These are the sections at D plus T by 2 that we have to consider, okay? The critical sections in each case, right? And I've shown the ordinates in many. Now, due to uh, wearing coat, this will be the bending moment, next the shear force, at bottom shear force, and right the actual force diagram in the box. And due to live loads, so we shall have this. And due to earth pressures, if we consider the earth pressures acting and we do our moment distribution or our stand pro or our midas, then we would get these distributions for the raw case. And these are the values we get. And of course, the ordinates are important for checking, right? Top. Then we come to the uh, surcharge. We have a surcharge due to a live load. And having taken that value earlier in the calculation, we have uh, put it and we get that based upon that distribution, we get uh, these uh, values due to surcharge of bending moment, shear force, and actual force. These are the stress results we get. Then coming to the load factors, because now we have for each kind of loading, we have the bending moment, shear force, and uh, actual force diagrams. Then the partial safety factors, because for SLS, ULS, and we have different combinations to be taken. Usually we neglect temperature for structures below the earth and in the ground and also earthquake will not be considered for such minor structures especially also that in the ground so we do not consider those load combinations requirements for loads in the load combinations we don't take them into consideration usually so the basic combination dead load wearing a uh, live load then uh, uh, the earth pressure and the live load surcharge these will be the partial safety factors we have to use when we use a rare combination, these will be the partial safety factors. And when we use a quasi-permanent combination, these will be the cases with no live load taken in the quasi-permanent combination. So ULS is designed for the basic combination. So if we go back and we take each of these bending moments and shear forces uh, and so on, and factor each of those ordinates by 1.35, 1.75, etc., and combine them all, the combined diagram will be like this for bending moment, for shear force on the right and for actual force in the bottom. So under basic combinations, when the load factors are applied to each of those diagrams, and we will add them up with pluses and minus, tension being minus, plus being tension on the outer face being considered as a minus sign, and sagging moments as you see here being considered as a positive sign. And this is the way we will get our bending moments and shear forces in our structure, right? Uh, for the basic combination. Mind you, if we take a rare combination, these diagrams will be different. And so if we take a quasi permanent, these diagrams will be different. But for the first ULS check, we check design for ULS first in an RCC structure and check for serviceability later. So designing for ULS combination, uh, we take the ULS, we take the basic combination, and these are what we get on combining those various raw load cases that we have. We combine and we get these. Now we check for effective depth. Okay, and this is from table six of IRC six. You and your FYD is nothing but FYK by 1.15 uh, and strain in steel. These are standard features which you know from normal uh, uh, basic design of uh, RCC. Uh, you get these and you get uh, the lever arm and you get the X limit by D. Therefore, X limit by D is 0. 0.66. Then work out the moment of resistance based on this formula and you get for M30 grade, you get MR which is a 0.172, which is the value we have, times 30, which is uh, 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 your FCK, 
uh, sorry, your, your uh, grade of concrete, your FCK, which is 5.16, okay? And that you get and call it as R. We call that value as R. The maximum bending moment, which we have from earlier, 107, where is our bending moment for the top slab? We're considering the top slab. Uh, here at the bottom, you see the bottom value, 107. We're checking for the effective depth. So we take the maximum moment in general, 107, uh, the ordinate here, 107 being the highest. We will consider that. And considering that, we get B. So B is 335. We work that out. And the moment of resistance is 107. So the D minimum, sorry, this thing has jumped up. Uh, this uh, thing in between this, this one here, this one should actually be here. This should actually have come down. It seems to have jumped up. So D minimum, we work out. Uh, we take this value R out here. And P is, of course, 1,000 into depth of paper, 1,000. And 5.16, this is this value. And th the actual moment that we have from that uh, diagram that I showed you, the based on the uh, combination, we get this value, 144.27, which is less. So it is much less than the effective depth that we have taken. So that is all right. We can go ahead. The effective depth is much less than the 335 that we have taken. So OK, the effective depths are satisfied. We don't need to change our dimensions or so of the uh, uh, section that we've taken, even for the maximum moment of 107, which we took. So that's the first thing we do. We check for the we check for the effective depth. Taking the worst moment situation, we check for the effective depth and see that that is what thickness we have taken uh, of the wall members or the, the whichever member it is, in this case, the bottom slab, top slab, all. We take the worst one and see we satisfy it, and therefore we are OK with it. Now, Characteristics for normal strength, this is a table 6.5. Here, very important values, third number, FCTM for grade M30 is 2.5. The third row, FCTM for M30 is 2.5. And ECU2 is 3.5. This value, ECU2 is 3.5. This value, FCTM is 2.5. That's the mean tensile strength in concrete. The, the concrete alone, its own mean tensile strength is 2.5. And here you have a uh, 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 ECU2 as 3.5. This table is important, as Mr. Raj Shetty earlier told us and explained to you. So is this from SP16, for FCT of 30. For various FCKs, the SP16 handbook uh, 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 gives you for M by BD percentage reinforcement in the center uh, for various grades of uh, steel. So we have FE415. So we have this, this FE415, this one, FE415. And we have here a value of M by BD, which we work out. Knowing that our strength of concrete FCK is 30, we, we work out and we get a 100 ES by BD, which is the percentage PT, 100 ES by BD, as we know, for that, like our normal design. Okay, so coming to the design of the top slab, uh, we always have to take a minimum N, okay, a min N minimum. This is the minimum actual force necessary so as to design the element for combined effects of NNM. We always have to consider that there is some actual force, which is 0.1 FCD AC, this value, as per the code clause. I've given you all the clauses in yellow. So taking this, we get a, a value of N minimum of 567. We have FCD, which is nothing but 0.45 FCK. B, as I told you, is 1 meter or 1,000 millimeters at per unit run. Uh, so 420, and we get this value of divide for kilonewton divided 1,000, we get 467, uh, 567 kilonewtons. The actual force in the member is 70. If you go back to uh, this diagram where the actual force, you see this value is 70, right? This actual force in the top slab is 70. So The actual force, the member needs to be designed since it is less than uh, the n minimum. Since n actual is less than n minimum, then we may be designed as bending element only, neglecting actual load. So we design purely as a flexural member the top slab. So the minimum AS, then the minimum reinforcement as per the clause is 0.26 FCTM of FYT, BTD of. FCTM is the mean tensile concrete strength, which you get from the table which I just showed you, FCTM, which is 2.5. And FCK is the characteristic yield strength of steel, which is the yield strength of steel divided by gamma M of steel. That's FYK. Uh, so, sorry, the FYK is the actual value 415, uh, not the factor, the reduced value 415. 
FYP. So we work this out, point this, 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 by B is 1000 and 335, the effective depth which we work at, we get 567. So the longitudinal reinforcement, kilonewton. Then the longitudinal reinforcement at support, where we have negative moment. Again, if you go back to that figure, where we have that five, ten. At a distance, we consider the negative moment at a distance P by two away, that's at the face. This is the center line, of course. So at P by two away, we get the value at the face as five, 53.5. And that value, we plug in here, this value here, by BD square, and we get a ratio, okay? Now, the, from that, we enter the table, uh, the SP16 table, and we get the value of, of grade of 415 steel, we get 100 years by BDS, 0.14. The 0.14, it works out, uh, therefore, making AS the subject of the formula, we get the area of steel required is 4610 millimeters square, which is less than the 524 millimeter square, therefore provide a 524 millimeter square uh, 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 that we should get here. Now, where did we get that 524 millimeter square? Therefore provide uh, the, 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 this value, uh, which is this maximum spacing, let us take 250, then we provide 12 bars at so and so, getting an actual area of so much is slightly more than this, just slightly more than this. Okay. So, this is the way we get the maximum spacing. Then, we'd be at most 250. The clause in the code shall be lesser of 2H or 250, since if we take 250, therefore, from the clause of the code, and we provide this as the reinforcement uh, in the top slab. Then, the second B is taken as 20% of the primary. The 20% the, of the main reinforcement is taken as the secondary reinforcement. This is also the, this at the code in the uh, secondary reinforcement. Okay. Now provide 10 at 350 center to center. Uh, uh, AST will be of so much AST. The longitude of reinforcement of the mid span is designed using that moment. Again, we get the M by BD. We get uh, PT, which comes out to be 0.2 from the SP16 table. Then we work out AS and then we provide the AS that is required. AST that is required, and 20% of it is provided in the secondary reinforcement, that is 10 of 350. So now we have designed more or less the top slab with for flexure, then we check it for shear. The design for shear VED, again from that draw, draw, diagram that we had, combined the diagram that we had for the basic case, the VED for the top slab is 109, I'll just show you. The VED at, at the distance D from the face is 109. The distance is value 109. And the, yeah, we check for sure, uh, 109. Then the N, of course, from that actual diagram was 70, which we saw. D is now, the, since we have provided 12 dia steel, 420 into 70 from minus 12 by 2, this 339 is now the effective depth. And we get the AS, this should be sub W, this should be D sub W, sorry. We get the row requirement, which again is from the code clause. The design shear resistance should be greater than what is acting. The design shear resistance of the member without shear reinforcement is given by this formula, where each of these are qualified as K is to 1 plus 200 by D, which will be less than 2, where D is the depth, effective depth in millimeters. Uh, and uh, the, the, the CP, the value of K, then the value of CP is limited to 0.2 FCD MPA. Uh, so 0.2 FCD, which is 0.45, uh, 0.2 into 0.45 into 30 FCD, the design value uh, for uh, design uh, for concrete, design uh, stress for concrete, 0.45 into 30. So if it, since the CP it should be is limited to that, we, we limit CP, the value of CP that we calculate from our current case, where NED upon A sub C, this should also be sub C, A by sub C. Uh, that is 1000 area of concrete is 1000 per meter into paper and 420 is the thickness and that's what we get newtons per millimeter square which is less than 2.7 newtons per millimeter square 0.2 fcd so okay we can move ahead we don't need to get any shear reinforcement by plugging in all those values we get a design value and we see that 120 the resistance is far more than the actually imposed 109 Therefore, there is no need to have any additional shear reinforcement. Concrete alone is good enough 
as per the uh, not elements not requiring design shear reinforcement that is stirrups and links we can avoid having those links etc by uh, doing so in, in this case it is not required now the design of the bottom slab will follow exactly the same we design for flexure and check for shear uh, but there is one difference that i will show you and i have intentionally color coded all the reinforcement the primary and secondary you know are in are uh, given in different colors and in the last diagram, which I will show you of the detailing, where they are provided, you can pick it up and match it by color. Okay, so the, the, what, please note that the specific colors are actually the ones which uh, are used for the bars in the final detailing drawing. There's a direct tie, tie up between these two. Now, the secondary reinforcement, 20%, where did I want to, yes, the shear. Everything is the same for the bottom staff, it, uh, going by design for flexure and then check for shear. Here in the check for shear, we find that the concrete alone is not sufficient and the the vd is uh, it, 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 concrete alone is less than the actually imposed so uh, uh, resistance again shear so what do we do we can either increase the design resistance by either fck which we can't change it is 30 now or we can increase the area of steel or we can take the change the effective depth means change the section which we don't want to do so let's try where we had a, a requirement of of area of where where we had uh, a, a, a requirement of 10 at uh, 350 or so we would try uh, sorry 12 it should be 12 yeah 12 at 120 where we had a design requirement of 12 at 120 let us try in the top slab to increase the the reinforcement to 16 at 150 instead so that we increase the shear resistance and we may not have to use the stirrups or links as i call it so again, since we will 16, we are trying 16 at 150 centers. This is the area of steel. Uh, if we try that and we do, we get the new effective depth and ASL about B sub B W W should be the sub subscript B. We get this, the new B, uh, we get 3.98. And if we plug all those values in as per uh, the design shear resistance equation, 10.1, uh, uh, 12, uh, et cetera, et cetera, this big equation, then we land up with 120 and that is more than the 109 or whatever so there is no need for shear whatever the value is there uh, there is no need for shear reinforcement and the bottom slab shear in the bottom slab at d plus t by t away okay that was the only the trick here was to simply increase the uh, rebar and reduce the spacing and therefore having increased the steel uh, the shear demand uh, longitudinal steel we could take care of the uh, uh, requirement uh, in, in design that was the uh, important uh, difference okay this 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 uh, area 16 at 150 uh, then we get uh, the value here which is exceeding vd which is equal to 156 from that diagram at, uh, from the center line combined uh, rare combination I mean, uh, basic combination diagram since the resistance is more than the imposed uh, in shear therefore there is no need for additional shear reinforcement concrete alone is good enough so design of the side walls, the walls are designed with a minimum of 0.1 FCD AC, okay, neglecting action loads. Now, when does that happen? We have the height of the wall, that is the side walls, the two side walls. We're taking any one side wall, 4.42 center line distance, thickness is 420 millimeters, H by T, that is the height of the wall from the center line, and this 12. It should be less than 12, should not exceed 12, and we can design it as a short wall. Check for N minimum, where N in the wall is 207. If we go back to the diagram, we'll see in the wall. So I'll just show you. This is very important that, yeah, this basic, under basic combination, we've combined all the cases. Then we, you see this 144 and 207. Okay. So the side, sorry, back to the side wall, the 207 at the base, check for N minimum, maximum N in the wall is 20. It should be less than the minimum. N minimum is less than N. The wall is designed only for flexure. Okay. So how the wall, then the longitudinal reinforcement at the top of the wall should be given by 0.05 NWT, where NW is the ultimate action load. Again, if we go back to the action force diagram, we will see that it is 144. And N minimum as per the clause, uh, which should be designed as per the clause, uh, the equation from the clause here, N minimum 0.05 NWH, 
So that's H, 0.42, and NW, which is 144, and uh, M, M minimum comes out to be 3.02. So at the top, the actual value at the top is 68 kilonewtons, which is more than uh, M minimum. At the wall, which is more than M minimum. And we can, uh, 68, you see here, is 68 at P by 2 away from P by 2 down from there, the center, center line, and we come to the outer face. This is the value at 68, which we have. And that's how we are able to check for the, the wall uh, in uh, as a short wall. Then the longitudinal reinforcement which we are talking about is greater than n minimum, so that is fine. We will. There are then so many clauses that are there for the negative moment. We take that minus negative by bd square, 68 from that divided by 350, 335. We work out the percentage of steel from the table, and therefore the steel that we need to provide is worked out. And as for that clause, the minimum bar diameter, this clause, this is the AS by 100 AS by BD that we get. We get this demand, this value. However, there's a clause which says the minimum diameter should be 12. The total area of vertical minimum should be 3.12. And so this is out from the code for the design of a wall element. So we saw the reinforcement should put on two faces. In each face, the area should not be less than so much a area of concrete AC. The spacing between should not exceed 200. So here AC is 1000 to 420. Uh, minimum area of steel on one face, which we point 102 into this on one face, not be less, which is 504. Provide say 12, this area we get 12 at 180 centers. This is what we get. Okay. The spacing between vertical bars should not exceed 200. Okay, we have 180, that is fine. Again, this will be the reinforcement in blue, which you'll see in the detailing diagram. Then you check for shear at the top of the ball. We have the VED at the top of the wall, and therefore we get the uh, depth. Uh, using 12 dia bar at the top, the main longitudinal bar is 12, so 12 dia by 2, uh, and we work out the rho, and we get the 1 plus k, sigma ct, and we are exactly the same as before, same procedure as before, and we get the uh, value 135 kilonewtons for the resistance, which is more than the VED of 59.4. Therefore, again, we don't need any shear resistance, shear reinforcement. The longitudinal reinforcement at the bottom of the bar, we have provided that in the bottom slab. We know the moment at that place. We know the NW. Similarly, and we work out the N minimum. Uh, for this, let us assume 12 diameter bars. Therefore, D is again 339. And the negative moment, uh, we, we get M negative. We get this at 0.8 P, which, uh, and uh, PT is 100 years by BD, which is 0.24. Therefore, the area of steel is again worked out. Uh, the area of steel 0.24 into so and so by making the subject of the formula. We work out the area required to be provided. Provide so much. Actually, we'll provide so much area. Therefore, then check for shear at the bottom of the wall. We have the VD, the end from that diagram, ND. And we have again, we work out for shear again, all the same, same procedure for checking in shear. Uh, and we see that the the resistance that we are able to have is 1516, which is greater than the VED uh, shear at the bottom of the wall in the shear force diagram. Okay. So the transverse reinforcement in the direction into paper, that is the transverse, the horizontal reinforcement. Again, there is a clause which says the reinforcement provide both sides. It should not less than 25 of the vertical or 1007 area of concrete. The spacing should not exceed 300 of the bars. The minimum diameter of bar is 8 mm or 1 fourth the diameter of the vertical bar. So minimum 8 mm or 12 by 4. So 12 by 4 is too little. So minimum is 8. So we take 8. Minimum of horizontal reinforcement is uh, 25%, 25 by 100 into 2 into 870, which is the area which we have already provided for that reinforcement. Uh, 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 the horizontal re the reinforcement we just provided. Uh, 878, there you are. 870 we have provided. And therefore, you get the 435 millimeters per meter, millimeter, if you like, per millimeter run. So, area of the horizontal reinforcement we get. And uh, uh, per meter, it shouldn't be per millimeter. I'm sorry, it should be per meter. Everything should be minimum per meter. Uh, so, we get the uh, minimum area then that we need, the minimum area of horizontal reinforcement on each face. Area of horizontal is 435, 420. So we would take 435 uh, that we have to provide, should not be less than 435. Provide 435 by 2 at 1 on each face, uh, inner and outer. This is what we get. 
So 10 at 100 will be the horizontal reinforcement with an area of so much, demand is so much, we are providing so much. 10 at this, in this color, you will see it will be uh, final figure which I'll show you. Then you check for serviceability limit state. Serviceability is important. For deflection, it is spanned by 800. We have designed now all the sections for bending and shear at all the critical sections. We have done that. Now we will have to check for serviceability limit state. Now for serviceability limit state, this deflection check is very simple. It is spanned by 800. Okay, we know the span 4.42 divided by 800 is 5.553. Now that again from the code clause. Now if we consider from the free body diagram of the top slab subjected to live load only is shown in this figure. You remember we had done the dispersed strip and all that, and we had got this P20. If we smear it, that value on the top slab, we get 32 uh, whatever kilonewtons per meter. A plus a moment is a free body, since we'll have a fixed end moment, therefore, just taking the top slab alone, this free body will therefore have to be having this moment at the end, okay, and the reaction on, on the edges at the center line of 4.42. Uh, the two center lines of the two walls on each side. So this is the free body of the top slab. Its deflection, if we consider like this, and if we consider the moment, minus, this would be a negative M upon L squared ETI, and this deflection wave 4, 5 by W4 upon 384 EI, they work that out. Uh, the gross spectral rigidity of the slab EIG for a cracked section, considering a cracked section where I gross, uh, you know, we have to take EI crack for the section, so we work out EI gross, that BT cubed by 12, etc. E is 3.1 for concrete and 10 power 4 into whatever all this uh, 1000 into 420 cube BT cube by 12 uh, kilonewton meter square. Uh, we got that value. Now we take the flexibility of the crack slab, EI crack, as 0.7 of this. Again, this is from the code clause, 70% of the crack moment of the measure. This is produced from the code. So 7 into 9, uh, whatever, into so and so is, point, set, set, you know, into 10 power 4, which is. Uh, 0.7 or 7 into that in 10 power 4, which is, it should be 0.7 actually, it is 13.4 into 10.4 kilonewton per meter square. So the EI crack we have worked out. Now the deflection will be based upon this crack, okay, 5 by 384, etc. all that one. The important point here is to have worked out this crack value and to put the crack value in the, uh, in, in, in the EI crack for, for I crack, okay, for I crack. EI crack or I, EI crack will be this value that we put here, this value. And then we add the two up and we see that the, if we add the two, the deflection is only 7.26 millimeter, which is less than the allowable of 5.53 millimeters. So we're not, uh, we're satisfying the serviceability requirement during service of the deflections being under very much in control, under control. Then for the rare combination, we check for the stress levels in materials, okay? What is this rare combination? It is the combination where uh, a very rare in occurrence in that sense. It, in that combination, if we go back to the uh, load combinations that you had, you would have in that table in the red combination, dead load is one, uh, wearing force is 1.2 partial factor, live load is taken as one partial factor, surcharge of course is taken as one partial factor, surcharge is one, and uh, load factor, sorry, and the load factor for the surcharge is taken as 0.8 under rare combination, okay. So under that combination, we get this kind of a bending moment diagram when we combine the the dead load, the uh, wearing force, uh, live load, earth pressure, and earth, uh, uh, live load, earth pressure, and surcharge due to live load. And we add all them up, negative, positive, and algebraically we add, we get these values. Note at 0.21, it is 35.6, and at 0.21 here for the wall, it is 45.9 at the top and at the bottom. And here at the bottom slab, this is the moment value 0.2 of 0.21, that is half the thickness away at the base. Okay. These are important to note. Uh, we'll be using them in the example. The allowable compressive stress in concrete is 0.48 FCK, which is 14.4 uh, newtons per millimeter square. And the allowable tensile stress is 0.8 F FYK, uh, that is 0.8 of 415, that is 332. These are the allowable. Now the stress limits uh, we will work out as this the code clause which gives me those two calculations above. The tensile stress in steel should not exceed 300 newtons. This is very important. Though I have got a value of 332 allowable in steel, however my fatigue requirement says that I cannot exceed 300. I cannot utilize this 332. It is limited to 300. Please note this. Many people usually forget this check. Forget this item. 
and this is something which you should have. You can see the clause here. However, however pretty good necessary for the following, but is less than 300 MPa. Uh, you know that uh, we are more than 300 MPa. So you should see that a case, and uh, that is important to note. What will be the tensile steel, uh, stress in steel will be limited to 300 newtons per minute square in our case, many cases. Okay. Modulus of electricity of concrete EC equal to ECM, which is uh, this one. Uh, modulus of steel is this one. Now, um, the, the, I've reproduced this table before also for you uh, to get the values of FCTM and so on. FCTM at M30 is 2.5, and the value of ECM. ECM is 31, which is 3.1. This value is 3.1. And the modular ratio is ES upon EC, which is 6.45. Uh, this is the standard drawing you always have, of course, for neutral, neutral axis and the block and, and the transform section that it transformed this into uh, a, alpha E into AS and uh, the C equal to T and X by T from there. And of course, Z is the lever arm. And doing that diagram, the depth of the neutral axis, this is standard, it is worked out as so, and X is equal to 45.2 in our case, because we know what the steel is, 12 dia, et cetera, and all that. So we know X, we know D, we know to the center of steel, we know we can work out X quite simply. And therefore Z, the lever arm is simply overall effective depth minus X by T. Uh, so the lever arm between C and T, Z is D minus X by T, we work that value out. Then the stress in concrete is simply like normal m by 0.5 x b z. So that is the moment we know we have that value and 0.5 uh, into x into you have 45.2 worked out and uh, the, 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 the b is uh, 1000 millimeter because it's per meter into paper 1000 and z the lever arm z is here and this is this much which is less than 0.48 fcq. Okay, so the stress in concrete is less than a uh, 0.48 FTK. Similarly, the stress in steel M by AS, a, a sub S, it should be, should be sub S, is equal to uh, M moment, that moment, divided by uh, AS into 323, which is the Z, Z there, and then you get this, which is less than, not the one for fatigue, right? Not 0.8 FCK, this is 300 newtons per millimeter square, not 0.8, it, this is not correct, this is the value from fatigue consideration, okay, 300. So final stress then in the material, we, we have the actual cross-sectional area, AC. Okay? Then we have the perimeter and contact with the atmosphere. This is the thickness, uh, this is the thickness of the wall. Okay, and 8.7 is the width. If you remember, 8.7 outer to outer, the cross-sectional area the material. So you have outer to outer 8.7, 420. Uh, perimeter and contact, U is equal to 2 into 8.7 plus 420. That's the top slab has two side two side walls of 420 thick and uh, the, the, the width at top. Okay, so two, so we get the notional size of the number, two AC upon U, which is 4006. Uh, and the creep in, so we get the notional uh, uh, sort of perimeter, okay? Why I'm doing this is I will come to it shortly. Just stay with me and I will work back the calculation again with you. Uh, the, the perimeter and contact, then we get this notional size, we get this H naught, okay? The creep in concrete is mainly caused by quasi permanent force. What quasi permanent means? Dead loads and very poor in our case. Yeah. The short term loads like live load do not have any significant effect on e, uh, uh, ECM. Okay. So the, the uh, stress in tensile steel FS is given by this big formula, okay, where QP is the bending moment due to quasi permanent or sustained loads, and MST is the bending moment due to short term loading, right? The short term loadings. Uh, are there, which I've seen, okay? So when we calculate ECF, is derived from both the permanent and short-term load, okay? The EC effective, right? This term, long-term E, uh, the EC effective, or the long-term modulus of E, which we have to calculate, right? So the stress and tension steel FS has is got from this formula, which is alpha E, modular ratio into that in concrete at that level, and that this is what formula we will have to use. And the effective modular ratio applied on permanent loads only, where this value here is the creep coefficient. Uh, give all this formula, and we get separating it out. We get the two above equations. If we fit them, we get a simple equation of E effective is something times E uh, ECM. Okay? E effective long term is some 
value, constant value times ECM. So we need to get this value, and we need if we know ECM, we need to get E effective. Okay. Now calculation of E effective M uh, for uh, uh, MQP. Uh, we know this is the combination we have from that table which I showed you for dead load, uh, 1.2 for this, and for surcharge uh, for for. Uh, uh, Earth pressure one, so we combine these. These are the moments due to permanent loads. Then similarly, we get moments due to live loads and surcharge, uh, which are only for the temporary load, you know, the transient in nature, temporary in nature, not fully there all the time. So only live load and surcharge in our case. The final crude coefficient at the age of 70 years from table 6.9. If you see the table 6.9, you will get for the age of loading, lading and the notional size H0. So, uh, from table 6.9, it's a fixed value based on 70 years age of loading and the notional size which we have worked out, which I showed you, the, the notional size which we have worked out, H0. Based on that value, from that table, you will get a value of the coefficient as 1.96. So we can plug that in here. We have this, we have this in this equation, and we know what ECM is. And C effective is very simply worked out in this fashion. Uh, e effective is simply worked out in this fashion. Therefore, we get E effective straight away. ECM is so much, and E effective is therefore worked out as into ECM. It should be here. We get this value. The long term modular ratio, yes, upon long term D is so much. This value. See, now the modular ratio has changed because E has changed. And then X, D, X, and D, and everything will change because of the long term value of E being considered in this. In this situation, the neutral axis with long term modular ratio, we take that, you know, the same original, the same formula, but with a different uh, first moment of area formula, but the same formula about the neutral axis, the same formula, but now with this uh, uh, different values that are there for, for the uh, 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 depth of the neutral axis, we get x equals the new x and the corresponding diagram uh, uh, x, by, x minus x by 3, d minus x by 3. We get this value for the new corresponding lever arm with the long term modulus of D. The long term modulus, of course, changes to X and the D. And we take those into consideration the 318 and the 60. And here we put them in here. And based the stress in concrete is 3.68, which is less than the 0.48 FCK. And the stress in steel, uh, this should be sorry, AFS is so much, which is less than the 300 newton per millimeter square due to that fatigue limit that we have. Okay, this is the way we have checked the uh, 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 for 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 uh, stresses. The check for stresses is done in this fashion, including the long term value of E. You can similarly do this for the other moment sections, which are uh, uh, there in the other elements. We've done for the top slab. You can do for the wall and for the bottom slab, for the more critical moment sections in there. Similarly, the quasi-permanent combination we have to consider when we check for the crack width now. So crack width is, of course, based upon the spacing of the reinforcement. And uh, the, the, the very important is SR, what we call the spacing of the reinforcement. OK, it's a very inexact science, as it were. But some approach is given to sort of give a formal way of calculating it Okay, at the critical sections. So BMD in the quasi-permanent combination, where there is no live load, where there is absolutely no live load, dead load one plus uh, uh, one point two for the wearing uh, force and uh, one for the surcharge of the uh, uh, sorry for the earth pressure and no surcharge or live load is considered in the quasi permanent loading. This is the figure we get for the bending moment and the critical section of the bending that we have to consider. So frequent load combination the, in this condition quasi permanent load the allowable is point three you see here so. Allowable crack width is 0.3. Okay, we can't exceed that. Then we have to do our calculation to get the value of the crack width now. So, what is our crack width we have to get? And it should be less than the 0.3. So, the formula for considering crack width is SR max into ESM minus ECM. Okay, SR is the maximum crack spacing, sorry, the spacing between cracks. If cracks happen, what is the maximum spacing between cracks? And ESM is the mean strain in the reinforcement under the relevant combination of loads. We have taken that. Uh, okay, for, under the relevant ESM is the mean strain in the reinforcement. In the reinforcement under the specific combination of which we have taken as quasi permanent. 
and ECM is the mean stays in the concrete between cracks. So if there are two cracks, then between the cracks, this ECM is the mean stay in the concrete. So the allowable crack width is a function of the maximum crack spacing and those of strain, right? That of the strain, right? The, the, the strain difference, if you like, between the mean strain and the reinforcement and the mean uh, 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 strain in the concrete between cracks. So this value is to be limited. The, 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 this value, this value is to be considered and calculated as so, and it should be greater than this sigma SC upon ES. Okay, now let us see what all that is. The SC is the ratio, is the stress in the tension reinforcement assuming a crack section. So if we go back, this SC 0.6 sigma SC by ES, we will calculate that first, of course, is the stress, is the is the stress in the tension reinforcement assuming a crack section. Uh, alpha E is nothing but the uh, uh, ES upon ECM. Okay. And EFC and rho is AS upon rho effective, all this for the crack section. Okay. Mind you, now we are dealing with the crack section, right? So all these will be for the crack section. So this is what uh, an H should be. Uh, you see this out here, H should be H H C effective is a lesser of this, this, or this. We would take that in the work assumption and show you how that is done. And then you see here for the case of B form bars associated with pure bending alone, the last line. SR is given by this value here, uh, 3.4, sorry, sorry, is given by uh, this 3.4C, this value at the top, which I can't see, I can't see that by rho, and uh, that is the formula that we would be using to check our spacing, okay. Now, Ma'am, uh, I'm just having some trouble moving. Uh, this it's okay. Moment, Actually, yes. we are able to see entire screen of yours. There is no nothing. I, I know, but it's frozen. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> the screen is just frozen. So I'm just trying to remove. <laughs> I don't know why. Okay, I got it. So yeah, now, now it's the moving. The cover is 75. Let's do the calculations to get that value. Okay, for establishing the track. If you've got a clear cover. We have already designed for flexure and all that one, and we've got the 12 diameter bar in the top slab. Okay, it's effective as we close close code, code clause said. This, 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 D, this, this here will be uh, uh, the workout that H, H by D and all that stuff. We work it out. Okay, H by 2. Uh, we work that out. H is the uh, overall depth 420. H is the overall depth 420. 339 is our track. That one I showed you. D. Uh, and uh, then we get the H, uh, which is the minimum of these, okay, so we get AC effective, uh, B into HC, the minimum of these is 1249, this one, and rho effective, then will be area of steel upon area of concrete, the area ratio, but this will be with the effective or the long-term value taken from this, okay, 539 upon this. Area of steel, we know, we have already worked out and provided, uh, so we take the area of steel that we provide in this, which comes to this. Then SR max is 3.4, the maximum crack spacing that we can have 3.4 C by 1.9 rho upon so and so, which works out to about 727.22. Okay. Uh, this is, 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 is important. And the spacing now is 5 into C plus diameter of the bar by 2, 12 diameter by 2, not P coefficient, di bar diameter by 2 is 405. The spacing of the reinforcement is as we have already designed this 210, which is less than this 405, hence we should provide SR max can be at 727. We can take the value as 727, which we had calculated. SR max is 727, and uh, the spacing of the bonded reinforcement exceeds 5, 5 C5 5 by 2. We do that calculation and check, and we find that whatever design spacing we have given is less than this, so we can go for the maximum crack, crack spacing of 727. It's okay. We can go with that for the calculation. Now, the difference ESM minus ECM, uh, the difference in that value, which we have to get, is uh, given by this, uh, this, this formula, which I explained to you. And let us go and have a look at it again. Uh, this first formula, where ESM is the mean stress in the reinforcement, uh, in the reinforcement in the rebar, if you like, at, uh, uh, under that relevant combination, which we have taken as the quasi-permanent combination. 
minus ECM, which is the, the uh, mean strain in the concrete between the cracks that are formed, and SR is the maximum spacing between cracks, right? So, plugging all these values into this formula, we get, uh, this should be greater than this, plugging all these values, uh, uh, sigma C is, is, is the tension reinforcement, is a tension reinforcement, assuming a crack section, so we take the I crack, okay, we take that Z from the crack value of Z, etc. I, I using I crack here, and then we get this value of uh, SC, and 0.6 SC by S, yes, the right hand side of this equation works out to 0.6 into this divided by the, the, the Young's modulus of speed, we get this value. So we worked out the right hand side quite easily because Z based on the Z crack section that we have. Okay. Plugging in all that, we get uh, the right hand side should be greater. Now let us work out this left hand, this, this, this bit of the equation here. Let us work this out. FCT is the same as FCTM which is 2.5 again from that table which I showed you, the first, the two big tables that I showed you, not the SP61, the other one, uh, with all the properties, etc., E and FC and ECU, etc. From that, you can get FCTM as 2.5. You can have a look at it later, it is 2.5. And KT is a value considering the long-term effects of loads. That value is given in the code to be taken as 0.5. Let me see if I can show you that. The KT is a factor depend on the duration of the load, which may be taken off since it's a long term. We can take it as 0.5. The code directly gives you that guidance. So, working out this side of the equation, that is this part now, uh, we plug in those values. We've got all the values we need. We plug in the into this. We plug in. We have row effective. We have FCT effective. We have effective. Effective is the long term issue. So because. Uh, that is what we need. We, we use the long term values, and then we are getting an alpha E and we get a KT, and this is what we get. Okay, we get this the ECM, uh, but the minimum value which we calculated the right hand side of this equation is this much. And hence, this difference is working out to be has to be kept equal to this value. This is too small, we have to keep this value, and the width of the crack is therefore a WK. We work out the 727 the spacing of the crack minus this difference which we have got, which is 0.21, which is less than the 0.3, which is allowable as per the code. Yeah, this is a log width calculation, I know, but I hope I've been able to show you how it is done. You have the step by step approach, you can follow it, and similarly, we have to check for the wall and the bottom slab, okay, for the critical sections in the wall and the bottom slab. I've shown you how it's done for the top slab. Right. Now, the color codes of the reinforcements that I showed you that have been designed are shown in green. Actually, this green bar is continued all the way because no one, it's such a small item that we don't discontinue. Otherwise, this is the critical region in which the green bar has to be provided. This is the critical region in which the flexural steel bar has to be provided for the top slab, the top slab steel, the sidewall steel, and these two being the distribution steels into paper being the distribution steels that we have worked out as 20%, et cetera. In the case of the wall, it is 20% of this and so on and all that sort of thing, which we had worked out. So this is the reinforcement that you have based upon the color code. It ties in with the color code in the design example itself. So do this in color when you, when you are doing it. I have last, I'm giving you a, a teaser, uh, having shown you now the ULS, and having shown you now the serviceability for deflection, crack width, and and and, and uh, stress check, and which combinations of loads you use for which case, uh, and uh, how we are able to satisfy the, the requirements uh, for ULS and SLS cases uh, situations, I want to show, share with you in one minute or so, the two minutes or so, the live example I'm going to give you. This is from the I think this is from Delhi Mumbai Expressway. Uh, the, the 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 new one that's been built uh, with the service roads on the side and the box culvert there and so on and so forth and you see that the box culvert running from right hand side to left hand side this one in which the water will run the water will drain has a slope so if this is the slope the water will go from that side to this side down slope okay there'll be a slope and this is the main carriageway and these are the crash barriers of the controlled access carriageway and these are the two side slip roads in a 
of the expressway, the two slip road. And here you see the the the, the wall that is built here, abutment wall with the batter, etc., that is built here in this way. And our looking from top, you see this is the the box looking from top view. And uh, we go to the median here, there's a median, etc. And there will be a key plan showing where it is and the change, etc. A lot of notes will be given and the camber schedule and the salient dimensions of the box, all that would be given. And reference will be made to their JD, whatever they have, there's some other drawings will be called. And the other two drawings which are with this will be referred here. And they would give a schedule of levels and camber based upon the plan and profile that has been done by survey, etc. and established for the entire project. This one being at some location of change in the project, they will give the relevant uh, levels, etc. to be built. Because many times these are built before the actual embankment, even the, the highway embankment of the highway even reaches the location. You will see these structures having been cast and left in place at the location. So that is why these levels are very important to be given on the drawing. Okay, and there will be some notes, typical notes on including notes on the material and notes on the construction, how it should be considered, what first, second, third, what should be done, and so on. This is what is different from uh, the textbook example which I showed you, right? Then this is the cross section. If you look from the end, a section at BE in the middle, if you cut it, this is our box. These here are the construction joints like shear keys because concrete will not be poured in one go. If we poured up to here, then we green cut, what we call green cutting. These expansion joints are very, very critical. They should be treated properly and they call them green cutting before the concrete actually hardens. We jet it with water to expose the aggregate or with a tool, a roughing tool. We rub it so that before the concrete has fully hardened in its green state, it is to expose the aggregate so that we may have a good aggregate interlock between this one and this one lift. This concrete will be poured in first lift, from here to here in second lift, and from here to here in third lift. Typically, it's that large box culverts, you know. And so this is the way the top slab will be poured in this with this. This is what I want to share with you again. And you see all will be marked, which will be the lowest water level. Uh, at high flood level is irrelevant because we designed for it running full in any case and the full storm it should be it may be considered to run completely full uh, and typical reinforcement detailing in that example we didn't have a haunch here we have a haunch and you see the special haunch reinforcement most important detail this special haunch reinforcement is goes like this okay all the various bars those bars the top the bottom bar which we showed as a straight line actually is not a straight line it has a Anchorage length and development length like this, like this, like this, it goes, you see. So the detailing is important, and that is what is given in these drawings. Where if you see each of the down lengths and the side lengths, if you blow it up, if I could blow this up, I would show you show it to you. But see each of these bars, you see this length, for example, the haunch bar, this haunch bar, the length of this is mentioned in here. It is 200 or 200 or something like that in the haunch bar, the haunch. The lengths are measured, you know, they are all for the proper anchorage and development length requirements, they are given like that, okay? Then we'll have certain things about lapping, where we can lap the bars and all that, the 50, you know, the lap length, 56D, this, that, etc. They will give those requirements. Again, from the detailing section of the code, there is a separate section in the code uh, IRC 112 to do with detailing, okay? So that all this comes important. And we do some uh, split views. You see these four special bars at the corner that are given, they are of a different size. So they are all grouped, they are arrows to group them, the X arrow to group them, and then the bar mark is given. And we can refer the bar mark here, and we can know its shapes, uh, dimension, its uh, downturn size, upturn size, etc. the end size, we can get from the bar detailing. Uh, 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 Let's move ahead now to what Midas can uh, help us to, you know, create the box culvert bridge, and we'll see how we can easily perform the analysis and design using this software. Okay, so I'll just go ahead. So in my uh, presentation today, uh, I'll be discussing about uh, what Midas Civil can offer in terms of bridges. And uh, after that, uh, I will go ahead uh, with talk about some modeling and uh, then we will look at the analysis results and how we can perform design in Midas Civil software solution. Midas Civil, I believe, most of you already have heard this software solution. It's quite famous nowadays because of its immense capabilities in the field of bridge engineering. So let me go ahead. 
Midas uh, is actually a software that can perform the analysis of several types of bridges. So you can go with the simple type of slab bridge, frame bridge, or today as we are going to look at box culvert bridge to high end bridges like the suspension bridges, cable state bridges, extra dose bridges. So these are, there are like uh, all possibilities, even composite type of bridges can be done. And you can perform the analysis and design using Indian codes. So I would like to just uh, show here some applications of, bo of box culverts. Uh, this is, these are the Indian applications itself and very close to you, as you can see, Navi Mumbai, Ranchi and so on. So these are several ways and please note over here the models. The models are in 3D. Okay. So over here as well, you can see. We are actually going to understand about how softwares can be useful for performing the analysis of structures. And although the box culvert seems to be a simple type of a structure, it is not so. I mean, there are a lot of aspects uh, when we are coming to the design as uh, Dr. Harshwardhan has already shown us uh, so many limits that we have to check uh, in the case of strength and serviceability and stress checks are there so, so several options i mean several things are required to be checked in case of box culverts so uh, i would uh, skip the introduction to the box culvert as we all already know about it move ahead to the different modeling parts okay so uh, there are several ways in which we can create a model in a finite element software depends on that software how it uh, allows you to create your model so you can use uh, the nodes and elements those are very basic things and uh, it's very important uh, to understand the finite element analysis because most of the programs are available uh, with the algorithms for based on finite element analysis so uh, we we have got over here box culvert today and uh, Midas Civil actually helps you to easily model your bridges using wizards. And one of our wizard is for box culvert. Uh, you can create integral type of bridges as well using this uh, wizard. However, today we will stick to box culvert itself. Okay. So, uh, yes, you can have a two dimensional box culvert. However, in two dimensional, you can even perform the hand calculations and there are other several approximations that you have to do when it comes to a 2D type of a box culvert. Plus, uh, it would be applicable when you have put segment, uh, segmental type of box culverts, wherein you are going to just, uh, you know, push in one, one meter of segmental box culverts at the position. Okay, so that's about uh, the two dimensional aspect. Then we are going to come at the three dimensional. Okay, so you can see here several types of uh, box culverts. There could be arches in the box culverts and you can also notice wing walls that would help to uh, retain the earth, the uh, earth pressure. And also you can see there are uh, some frame with wing walls and arch culverts type of options wherein uh, you can see there is only the top slab and there are side walls. So these are several types, but these are the most basic ones that we're going to talk about. That is the box culvert. Okay, at the bottom. So uh, let us understand about uh, the difference between 3D and 2D box culvert. Okay, so basically a 3D box culvert is where you can model your uh, three-dimensional box culvert, the entire box culvert using 2D elements, that is plate elements or shell elements. And we have 2D type of uh, modeling, which would include frame elements, or you can say 1D type of elements having six degrees of freedom at each end. So that's about our two, 3D and 2D type of modeling methods for box culvert. Now there are several advantages and disadvantages in both the methods. So let us understand how 3D would be useful and why I would like to recommend over here to use 3D uh, method of modeling a box culvert, okay? So here uh, we, we have for this option uh, this uh, uh, ability in a 3D box culvert to uh, consider the transfer stiffness in the box culvert. So we have seen that, yes, uh, the reinforcements, the main reinforcements are going to go in the longitudinal direction from one span to the, uh, from one span end, start to the end. But uh, there is going to be 
some effect of your uh, in the transverse uh, direction of your top slabs even and your bottom slabs also your walls so that's that's something that we need to capture and it is not possible in a 2d box culvert then further if you have a skew in your box culvert uh, then it is very much necessary to go ahead with 3D because you cannot capture uh, the effect of torsion in in case of a 2D analysis, okay? Because it's basically going to be uh, related to the transverse direction and the longitudinal direction, the angle made. So that is the reason also why we should go for 3D. Then uh, yes, 3D would be more practical because there would be some local loading effects if you look at the analysis results of uh, unsymmetrical loadings like we have got moving loads now we can be placed at any location and if you are going to just simulate one one d type of an element uh, of one meter let's say width of unit width then how are you going to simulate that information which could be at 500 mm from the center so it's it it will be possible with the eccentricities and so on, but we do not usually consider all those uh, eccentric type of loads or concentrated type of loads uh, at certain eccentricity from the uh, uh, 2D uh, line uh, box culvert. So that's uh, one part about local loading effects that we can assess in a 3D box culvert. Then um, dispersion effect. Now, live load dispersion is what we saw in, uh, in the last presentation that live load dispersion has to be considered in case of a 2D box culvert. And uh, uh, this basically, this phenomena is uh, basically taken care with the help of our uh, plate elements. So we do not need to actually calculate the dispersion uh, length and width, and that will be taken automatically care by the plate elements in that 3D box culvert. So a lot of calculation will be saved in that way. After that, uh, we have got, um, yes, the last one, it will be applicable to all types of box culverts. Like we have seen, there are different types of box culvert, arch box culverts and so on. So the 3D type, the 3D form of modeling would be more uh, practical and it will be applicable uh, with a 3D box cover all right so uh, that's basically uh, an idea of why we should go for a 3d modeling and uh, nowadays with a lot of software solutions not only Midas there are several software solutions that can offer you a 3d modeling uh, uh, option and uh, you can perform the analysis in it uh, but what Midas Civil actually offers you is also the design you can perform design of uh, 3d box cover in Midas Civil and that's the beauty of softwares. I mean, if any software is able to perform the design of a more complicated type of a structure, then you would definitely love to go ahead and create different types of bridges, take up more projects and try to work on um, several configurations. So that that's what the software gives advantage for. And now let's move ahead. Okay, so uh, yes, one more thing is about um, the soil structure interaction. Uh, yes, our box culverts are going to be placed on the on the earth, and uh, we need to understand how the how the structure is going to behave with the soil. And the soil is usually having certain stiffness. It's not going to be always rigid. So we need to specify the information about how the uh, I mean there is going to be certain stiffness basically uh, that would allow the box culvert to uh, displaced in the downward direction in some way and there would be some buoyancy effect as well in case of uh, waterlogged areas or even by the soil pressure okay so uh, basically with the help of soil structure interaction we can simulate the actual forces in the uh, in the superstructure or in the box culvert now here we have uh, two options available one is with the help of point springs and the other is with the help of distributed springs or area springs. So it is uh, definitely the common practice to apply the point springs to simulate the soil and uh, assign it to the bottom of your uh, plate elements or even 1D elements. So that is a common practice. However, uh, to make it more accurate, you can go ahead with the Wrinkler method of application of springs. And uh, that's available in the surface spring supports in Midas Civil. So, 
actually i would like to uh, go ahead with the um, modeling first and uh, then we will to understand all the aspects more clearly so i'll just go to the civil so that you'll have a feeling of uh, how we can simulate a box culvert in a software okay so it's uh, again like i mentioned it's very important to understand the basics of planet element to get into any program uh, how much ever automations are there in any program we by ourselves as engineers should understand uh, how the load dispersion or how any support is going to act or behave for our structure all right so um i'll go ahead now uh, we have what uh, did scaly software allows you to reduce a lot of work manual calculation work so you can see we have got uh, a database as well so from the database you can select irc and we can select m40 grade or m30 grade likewise there is a database so you don't have to specify the information about the modulus of elasticity poisson's ratio thermal coefficient so these are some things that we can take care okay so that's about the materials you can simulate the creep and shrinkage with the help of time dependent properties so those uh, those stress checks that uh, dr harshwardhan has shown we can definitely perform using a software more easily all right so uh, let's move ahead now and uh, we have several wizards there are various ways in which we can model manual modeling is there but uh, due to short time i would like to jump into the wizard method of modeling and uh, anyway our important part is design so uh, let's just quickly generate the box culvert okay so here you can just specify the mesh size mesh meshing is a very important aspect in finite elements you have to take care of the aspect ratio for your mesh then further you can specify over here the span as uh, we have uh, seen over here there is, there are some wing walls you can provide a thickness and the program can automatically generate then uh, you can provide skew angle or you can make it a straight uh, bridge itself no problem you can have curved type of box culvert as well so there are various options available further based on the images you can provide the dimensions so modeling becomes definitely easier in this way so let me assume over here like 350 mm of thickness for uh, the slabs and the walls and after that uh, you can consider haunches okay so there are haunches in box culverts to take care of the shear uh, that would, that would be coming between the top slab and the side walls uh, as well as the bottom slab and the side walls so you can consider that information as well over here all right after that uh, you can provide the height so uh, you can say let's say it is 5 uh, meter is the clear carriage way height and uh, you can not carriage way the clear height of the side walls and you can add the uh, distance half distance of the top and bottom slab so that would make it like 5.35 in that way and uh, then further we can go ahead provide the uh, bearing course information or even you can provide over here the soil depth and the program can automatically do the calculation so let's say we have got a uh, bearing course of 65 mm so likewise you can specify after that uh, you can provide the information in the transverse direction so again here you can keep the size of plate element uh, equal to the mesh size and uh, then we can specify over here uh, what would be the barrier width what would be the footpath width and so on so if there is uh, no footpath usually it is considered that uh, although there is a footpath on your bridge uh, it is considered that the footpath might be removed and the vehicles might run on the footpath nowadays we can see such things are happening uh, even though there is a footpath so uh, yes so that's basically about it okay so b5 is our carriage favorite so let's provide over here that information and uh, then i'll keep this footpath as 0 itself and 0.6 so in this way uh, we have basically provided the information about our carriage favorite and what all locations are there for the barriers 
then comes the boundary conditions so here the program can automatically calculate uh, uh, the stiffness uh, the point spring stiffnesses at different positions based on the area of the plate uh, what we need to provide in the software in most of the softwares not just Midas, in most of the softwares is the modulus of subgrade reaction okay so with the help of sbc that you get from the geotechnical data you can use thumb rules such as 40 multiplied by 1.5 that is uh, sf into the sbc so that sort of uh, gives you these uh, modulus of subgrade reaction. However, you can uh, go ahead uh, with some other calculations and provide over here the actual uh, modulus of subgrade reaction. So that's one thing. And then comes the depth of the soil. So how much ever you want, you can specify this information. It really does not affect the analysis results. All right, so let's come to the loadings. Yes. So uh, we are going to have, as uh, Dr. Harshvardhan sir has already mentioned about the loads that would be coming on a box culvert. So one of them is the earth pressure that would be acting on the side walls. And uh, we'll also have uh, the live load surcharge. There would be hydrostatic loads if there is wall. Uh, so there is water. Uh, there, if there is a groundwater level, then from the outside, we'll, having, we'll have the hydrostatic pressure. If the water is running through the box culvert, then we'll have the water pressure inside the walls. Okay. So yes, uh, we can provide all this information in one single platform. And yes, we also need to provide the moving loads and uh, the software does has, have the capability to uh, apply the moving loads easily on a plate element. So it's quite useful. So you can include the cell pavement and soil information it can provide the weight density the modular uh, the uh, angle of friction and you can specify the surcharge value as well okay that would be the surcharge uh, from this from the soil then uh, you, if you have a groundwater level then you can specify what would be the submerged weight density likewise and then you can specify what would be the ground level below your top slab and uh, then further specify what would be the barrier load and if there are any additional loads that you would like to add on to it. So if there is a sidewalk, you can specify the information with the crowd loading. Usually it is uh, five kilonewton per meter square. And after that, uh, temperature loads, temperature loads are also required to be applied uh, because yes, our concrete is vulnerable to temperature as well. And uh, you can see that there there you have to apply two types of uh, temperature loads one would be the uniform or the system temperature load and the other is the temperature gradient load so this temperature gradient load or the temperature differential temperature load throughout the depth of your uh, box culvert slab is uh, required to be calculated and uh, applied over here as a temperature gradient load so that's basically accounting our temperature difference seasonal temperature difference that would be system temperature and daily temperature difference, the day and night temperature difference can be specified with the help of temperature gradient. So these are the aspects and after that, uh, the code has also specified shrinkage strain and thermal coefficients. Uh, 